Plus. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, it's half past seven. It's Friday morning. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. Owen, good morning to you. Morning, Adrian. This is normally the point where we've had a jaunty evening watching the Europa League. It's nice and relaxing. Everybody's you get it's just the perfect accompaniment to doing preparation, a bit of preparation for the show of a Thursday night on. And it's been that way since time of memoriam, at least since uh, we went into lockdown last year. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Absolutely crazy la night last night. Jose Mourinho and his uh, post-match rant is pretty much all that anybody's talking about this morning. So between himself and the club captain, Hugo Lloris, that are right pop off uh, their colleagues last night. Let's give you a bit of a flavour of that before we get into it. Before the game, I told the players to play to win. I told the players to refuse a feeling of if we draw or if we lose uh, one nil or two one is okay i told the players don't trust don't go in that direction play the game to be dominant play the game to 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 win it at half time even with the result zero zero i told the players don't trust it don't do it if they score a goal, even minute, I told minute 75, 80, 85, the game is open and then they will believe. So by surprise, the players were not caught. Uh, so it was not a surprise. How are you? How are the team after that? Good question. Um... I think we are all more than disappointed. It's just uh, a disgrace. Uh, I just hope everyone in the changing room feel responsible of the situation because um, it's a disgrace. Um, now, what can I say more about it? Uh, talking about the game of Sunday, uh, I think it's not the right moment. Uh, the taste of the defeat tonight is just uh, more than painful and. Um, and we are all responsible of that. Which hurts more, Hugo? Arsenal at the weekend or this one tonight? No, it's just the accumulation. Uh, obviously, uh, we are a club with full of ambition, but uh, I just think that the team at the moment is just the reflect of what's going on in the club. Yeah. Pretty caustic stuff from both Jose Mourinho and Hugo Lloris there. Uh, I told the players to go and win the game. I can't believe they didn't win the game, was the short story from Jose Mourinho. And uh, he is really firing a lot of pelters in the direction of his players on in a way that I'm going back. I had said a number of weeks ago that this was the end game of Jose Mourinho. I changed my mind because he got all the players fit back again. While still wondering whether, you know, why it took him so long to get Deli Ali and Gareth Bale uh, back in the pitch. But that notwithstanding, I thought he'd turn this thing around. But the evidence of last night and his reaction to it afterwards, like, I think that if I'm his players looking at that last night, I'm like, look, fair enough. We absolutely stank the house, house out. But you need to be delivering that message in here. Like, going out in front of the cameras afterwards and publicly castigating his players like that. Like, I think that we're in a position with Jose Mourinho now. It's hard to see him get this one back, I would offer, like in terms of the, he talks about the engagement of his players, like even Hugo Lloris was pretty much echoing everything that Mourinho had said, the disgraceful comment. He even went as far as the interviewer, uh, the question he had said, good question, which was exactly what Mourinho I'd noticed had said at the start of his interview. Um, but I, I, I think it's going to be hard now for Mourinho to turn this one around. Tottenham might have to stick with him as the only thing, like he's contracted until 2023 with no exit option on that contract. Do Tottenham have the money and are they willing to spend the money that will that it will take to give Jose Mourinho this massive exit They might have no that, option on. Yeah, they, they might not, but it is going to be a significant payout to Jose and they'll have to accept that they've got this one badly wrong. I agree with you that there have been numerous different dawns actually under Jose Mourinho. I think 
was it Spurs against Sheffield United at the end of last season, post-pandemic. Uh, it was in the summertime anyway, and I think it was a Thursday night. I think we were on here on a Friday morning. And we were concerned about the future of Harry Kane, if you were a Tottenham mm. fan, that I don't think they got beaten on the night, but they didn't create enough, and Harry Kane wasn't getting enough service. And part of that blame was at the door of Jose Mourinho because of the way he set his team up. Now, I think we were eating hum humble pie a little bit after that because they started the season so well. And uh, I certainly felt a little bit stupid for even saying that at the end of last season because they started the season like a house on fire and Jose seemed to have rediscovered his mojo and he seemed to have discovered the mojo of Tottenham Hotspur that perhaps we haven't seen in a long, long time. And then all of a sudden, it just goes completely off the rails this season to the point where Tottenham Hotspur are now showing all the very worst stereotypes of that football club the lads, it's Tottenham, the lily-livered performances when they go and gets tough. The sort of team that we saw last night is a team you would expect to, to, to destroy a team like Dinamo Zegre, but all due respect to them, Harry Kane should be the best player in the Europa League bar none. He is the best player in the Europa League bar none. And to get beaten in that manner is humiliating. It is absolutely humiliating. And there is one man that we know in football that surely feels a level of embarrassment when these things happen, and that man is Jose Mourinho. I've got no problem with him coming out and blasting his players after the game. He gets asked these questions. He's got to give an honest response. I think Hugo Lloris is well entitled to do it, as well as one of the most experienced players in that dressing room. Things are not good there at the moment. And Tottenham Hotspur, to make a change, you assume that they're going to have to go for the easy option, which is sacking Jose Mourinho. But that is also going to be detrimental to their finances. So, not a good morning for for Spurs fans no. today, for sure. I have to say, on I don't know, I wouldn't share your admiration of his honesty after the game. Like it's actually so rare that you see a manager come out. You can be, you can rest assured, right, that after every sporting occasion <clears throat> that involves a coach afterwards, if their team doesn't get the desired result internally, they're thinking. Well, I mean, I've done everything. No matter what they're saying outwardly, they're like, I've put this team in the best possible position. And a lot of the time, they just have to take one for the team in the words of Fire Festival. That's just what's got to happen, right? Uh, like, Steve Bruce is the last one that I can remember. And it isn't that long ago. Where I remember he was blaming his, one of his subs a couple of weeks ago. He sent some lead in off the bench and he said, tell them to go three at the back, whatever it was. And in the space of 30 seconds that the player had been on the pitch, he had managed to deliver the news and got absolutely ripped in you on by Steve Bruce after the game, who's the only man right now this morning ahead of Jose Mourinho in the race to get sacked. And he ain't shifting from there, no matter what happens with Tottenham. If they lose the next 20 games in a row, uh, Tottenham and, and Mourinho's still there. I still think Steve Bruce is going to be ahead of him in that race. But I, I do think that I do think that doing that publicly is no good. I think no good can come of it. I think that his players are looking at it thinking, what loyalty have you got to us? I think whatever, however much they'd switched off before that game last night, I think that that's it gone now. I don't think that uh, they're going to suddenly turn their, their attitude around on the basis of Mourinho ripping them a new one in a post-match interview. I think that it'll probably, in fact, go the opposite direction. And I think that what you'll see is once he leaves and Avram Grant or Yogi Love or Wayne Rooney or whoever it is that comes in to replace him, the attitude is going to be absolutely bang on. You'll see that because they'll be looking to um, make some sort of a message to to their fans and to the public that, well, it was that guy that was stinking the house out. Nothing to do with us. Well, the attitude was right for a lot of this season, is the thing. The, the attitude was almost a ruthlessness that, that we had seen from peak Mourinho teams that we were seeing again this season. A, a team that wasn't just satisfied to be the team one or two nil. And like we saw it recently enough in that game against Burnley where they absolutely smashed them, that there was an edge about this team still. I think what's becoming more apparent is that those big results for Tottenham weren't fluky, but they were certainly not that much down to what Jose Mourinho is bringing to the table. It's all down to what Harry Kane and Youngman Son has brought to the table, mm. what Gareth Bale, who let's not forget was one of the best players in the world a few years ago, what he was bringing to the table and what Lucas Moura can bring to the table. It was a coincidence, I think, that Jose Mourinho happened to be the manager of this team that was doing so well for the early part of this season. The, like the real, it's not even a dilemma, I think, at this point. I think there is almost a sense that you keep Jose and you hope for the best that he can bring you into the top four next season or you get a new manager who will give you a better chance of doing that. And as a result, you'll be able to keep Harry Kane at the club. I think it comes down to that one player. Like I mentioned the other attacking assets there. But really, Daniel Levy needs to think, what is the best way we can approach this that Harry Kane is still a Tottenham Hotspur player at the end of next season? And we're confident that he's going to be a Spurs player into the season after that. Because 
it's almost like an American sports at this point where you build a franchise around a player. Tottenham Hotspur almost have to ensure that everything is built around Harry Kane because he is by far and away his, their best player, the player with the best attitude, their leader on the pitch and off the pitch. And I, I think that it would be worth the, the, the removal of Jose Mourinho, no matter how much money that would take in order to ensure he stays because he's got to be getting a cheap feet at this point. Playing in Zagreb is a bit of a dynamo Zagreb in, on a Thursday night is probably a bit of an offence to Harry Kane himself would actually lose that game. And of course, he was responsible as well. Uh, it probably twists the knife a little bit. And the, the whole loyalty to Spurs thing might be questioned over the next little while if nothing changes over the course of the, the three or four months, whatever we have before the start of next season. Yeah, well, it, it, look at it. I think that's a good point. I think that if Daniel Levy is looking around him this morning to think, where's this club, club at? Surely he's taken a sense check from the players. Are we... Are we still Jose doing doing a good job? Like, what are you thinking? And Harry Kane is probably one of those players he goes to. And uh, I mean, the response to that I think is somewhat important. It's we're just we're seeing what we've seen from Jose Mourinho at several clubs over the last number of years. In that uh, he just gets a bit dour, he gets a bit defeatist. To be honest, I think that's that's sort of where he's at. We shall see how it all plays out. As said, uh, Jose is second favorite in that race to get the bullet and. Um, an interesting list of uh, people that are uh, in the offing to, to replace him. But we're not quite there yet. I'm sure we'll have plenty more chat about Jose Mourinho over the course of the morning. You are uh, watching OTB AM. Love to get your comments in over the course of the day between now and 10 a.m. Please do get into contact with us, whether it's a bit of Jose, whether you were watching Manchester United last night and we're really impressed uh, with them in the second leg against Milan or uh, any other events around the world of sport, please do get your comments coming into us this morning. Uh, OTB AM, live in association with Gillette. Good mornings. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Phil Egan, good morning to you. How are you doing, lads? How are you getting on? Jose Mourinho nearing the exit door, Phil, or can turn the ship around? Uh, look, we know how it ends. The question is what happens before it ends. And this window seems to be getting smaller and smaller in terms of Jose Mourinho. You know, he replaced Pochettino last season and this was his first full season. You thought, yeah, he's got a really good squad. Things started pretty well. Uh, after they got over the, the the opening weekend defeat to Everton, th you know they had those impressive wins where they just sat in, obviously hammered United at Old Trafford, beat Manchester City, beat Arsenal. But said it last Monday after the defeat to Arsenal, if you actually look back at the the wins that they've had this season since their win over Arsenal at White Hart Lane, they haven't beaten any good teams in the Premier League. And any time they come up against a decent side, they lose to them. And he's pretty much put it all into the cup competitions. That League Cup final on the 25th of April will seem like an age away for Spurs fans. Mm. It'll be fascinating to watch them over the next little while. We will have a lot more Jose chat over the next uh, uh, couple of hours. Uh, Manchester United, one of the other big talking points last night, Phil Paul Pogba, I mean, the biggest talking point from that game. He comes in at half time. He makes an average team look good, this guy, when he's, uh, when he's on form. Yeah, look... We've spent so long talking about Paul Pogba since he joined in 2016, what's his best position? Oh, he doesn't do enough, he doesn't control games, but that's not what he he's meant to do. It's Paul Pogba, you bring him on and you get him as close to goal as possible and he'll affect the game. And Solskjaer has been criticised in the past for not making substitutions quick enough and you know his, uh, his team has been accused of being tired looking over the last few weeks because... You know there is that. <clears throat> excuse me. There is that dependency on Bruno Fernandez and certain players. And if you take them out, you're not as good. So the temptation is always going to be there to play them. And we saw that even in the, the Real Sociedad second leg at Old Trafford, where United had the tie wrapped up after winning the first leg four 0 He still played a really strong team. And he, you know there was a few people critical of him for that. But yeah, Pogba's comeback from injury is just a, a nice little injection that United need between now and the end of the season. They're going to finish in the top four. That you know they, they could lose a few games between now and the end of the season, but they've, they'll guarantee Champions League football. Now it's about trying to sprinkle a bit of silverware on top of that. I know Solskjaer said in the build-up to this game that winning trophies, uh, certain cup competitions, was all about ego for certain managers. I, I don't know who he's talking about, but... Um, <laughs> he's going to be judged on his league position and that may well be the case that there's no point in winning 
uh, Europa Leagues or FA Cups if you're not finishing top four all the time. So the top four is, is guaranteed now. But Solskjaer has to go and win a trophy. And Rashford spoke before the game about how when they dropped into the Europa League after being knocked out of the Champions League, as disappointing as that was, the target was to win this competition. And looking at today's quarterfinal draw, United would have to be the favourites, I would imagine. Yeah, and Arsenal alone. I mean, you you spoke about it last week, but they almost contrived to knock themselves out last night. Uh, they, they almost did. They, like, they contrived to lose the game last night. Uh, on the scoreline, I think uh, that it wasn't a, a necessarily a fair reflection of the opportunities that both teams had. Like it's just a bit of a nervous roller coaster having to experience Arsenal in these positions, despite having a three-one, definitely a three-one cushion from the first leg. Like I mean, it still creates a hell of a lot of nerves. Like Pierre Aubameyang almost scores this incredible back heel last night, which would have topped off. A pretty poor performance. He goes one on one with the keeper a few minutes beforehand, puts the ball five yards wide, like wasn't even close to going to the back of the net. And he sort of underlined before the back heel why it was actually kind of an easy decision for Mikel Arteta last week to drop him. And I think this is something that's been overlooked in the conversation around Arsenal all week. That would Mikel Arteta have made that exact same decision 12 months ago or at this point in the season, last season? I'm not sure he would have. I think Mikel Arteta took a calculated risk at the weekend and thought to himself, you know what, the drop-off between Aubameyang and Lacazette ain't what it once was. Aubameyang is not playing well this season, and I think he felt that he could get away with it. I think it was a simple football decision, and he felt that he could get away with not having Aubameyang and his team. This is a guy who is not only fighting to get back to a level where he is a golden boot winner, he needs to get back to a level where he is a guaranteed starter for Arsenal once again, because I'm not sure he is a guaranteed starter in the next round. I thought he was poor and anonymous at times last night. As I say, he could have popped up with that back heel at the end of the game. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, this guy, all he needs is one chance and he's an absolute magician. I still think you need a lot more from your number nine, especially when he's being paid the money that he's being paid. So I think there's a great opportunity for Arsenal to go and win this competition. But the pressure is very much a Manchester United because they are the best team in it. United, Ajax, Arsenal, maybe Villarreal. Um, they're, they're, the, they're the sort of the, the, the teams that you would, you would uh, put up at the front of the queue. Um, but you're not, United have to be thinking at the moment that this, this thing has to be theirs. Mm. They're the two favourites to win the tournament anyway between them. The Rangers uh, was the other story last night, Phil, on the pitch that were uh, dumped out of the Europa League, but it was very much, and just Stephen Gerrard spoke at length about it afterwards, uh, how angry and upset he was after Glenn Kamara uh, told him that he'd been racially abused during a side, uh, side's loss to Slavia Prague last night. And they replayed the footage last night in BT several times over, and it seemed hard to argue with Kamara, one of his teammates, who had clearly heard the... Um, uh, Andre was it who who had gone over to him? Uh, Kudela who had gone over to him to say something behind his cupped hands, but it seemed as if it was egregious, whatever it was. Yeah, and look, obviously an investigation has to take place, and we'll see how, what happens there. But one thing uh, we've seen in the past when UEFA investigate these things is the punishment is never severe enough, and if there is, if this uh, Slavia Prague player is is found guilty, then the the, the punishment should be severe because. You know, we've seen this for the last year nearly. Um, players taking the knee, and we, you ask yourself, why are they doing it? And people, some people, I, I know uh, certain players have spoken about this. Certain black players have spoken about this, saying that the the taking the knee now is becoming a bit tedious because is the message still hitting home? And incidents like this would suggest not that if this is still going on on football pitches, it's not good enough. And I think in the past, as I said, UEFA have not been strong enough when it comes to handing out punishments. And yeah, it, it was just a, a really grim incident and, you know, just a night that Rangers will want to forget quickly because yeah. they were in a great position to, to advance to the quarterfinals and it just all went wrong for them on the pitch before that incident. Um, obviously, Losing two men was never going to be a good thing. The the roof challenge, oh. he he may have had eyes for the ball, but he, I mean that is one of the the worst challenges. Well, he was he was he was afterwards was like making some sort of reparations with the referee as to why he should stay on, which is ridiculous. And we'll yeah. watch the the fallout from the other incident as it as it unfolds, Phil, because it's a uh, it's a high profile incident now, and as you say, they don't have a great record in punishing no, these things, and it don't. seems pretty pretty. I mean, well, we don't have it's all circumstantial the evidence, but uh, it does at the same time seem to be quite 
point there. A couple of comments coming in here. One on YouTube from somebody called Saragon McKenney, who I'm pretty certain is Tommy Rooney's uh, alternate handle, who's saying that all they're reluctant with his subs, burnt out Rashford, going to ruin him. Uh, he needs three weeks off. And another one from Wayne Ryan, where I'll put to you, Phil, here. Uh, could you imagine Kane with United and those young strikers? I'm not a United fan, but it looks like an obvious fit. Yeah, it would be be good sign. I, I still think Kane is going to stay. I think he has his record, his eye on that Jimmy Gray's record where he wants to become the club's all-time goal scorer. But yeah, he's, he's got he's getting to that stage of his career where he's got to be asking himself about trophies and th- does he want to be Tottenham's all-time leading goal scorer when he retires, or does he want to be a player that has won titles when he retires? Um, I mean, he obviously wants to do both at Tottenham, but. The evidence so far would suggest that that's not going to happen. Is a League Cup really good enough for for Harry Kane? And you know, people say he gets injuries and maybe he's not as explosive as he was. But what we've seen this season from Harry Kane is that he can play in a more withdrawn role. So yeah, he, he gets into so many of the the good teams in, in the Premier League. But I think one thing that's going to put teams off is that the asking price. That and you have to do you have to go and negotiate with Daniel Levy, which some clubs will just decide do you know what we'll go somewhere else we get we get a younger player and um, yeah. we probably won't have to pay as much money yeah the likes of Ronaldo um, Phil give us a quick round up of whatever else is happening in the world of sport if you don't mind yeah well obviously the, the draw for the last eight of the Europa League that's going to take place after midday and um, just Manchester United and Arsenal the Premier League teams in that draw uh, the Champions League draw will take place before that so that's due to take place just after 11 o'clock you've got Liverpool Manchester City and Chelsea in that one so between all those five clubs surely we're going to get an all Premier League clash somewhere um, obviously you're going to talk more about Mourinho um, the line coming out from him is he blamed the players mentality and uh, yeah, it's um, they've, they've got a, a game against Villa this weekend, and um, the the pressure is certainly on Jose Mourinho. The new SSE or Trinity League Premier Division season kicks off tonight. Shamrock Rovers host St Pat's at Tallis Stadium from seven forty five. Before that, at five forty five, newly promoted Drogheda United are at home to Waterford, now managed by former Ireland international Kevin Sheedy. One game in the Premier League tonight as well. Fulham at home to Leeds. Big game in terms of the relegation battle for Fulham anyway. And that one gets underway at 8 o'clock. The Cheltenham Gold Cup is the feature race on day four. And it's Willie Mullins trained album photo looking to make it three in a row. That one goes to post at five past three. First is the triumph hurdle at 20 past one. Shane Lowry obviously had a top 10 finish last week. And a good first round of the Honda Classic from yesterday in Florida. He's three under par, six behind the leader, Matt Jones. Podrick Carrington, a winner of the tournament in 2015, is two over par. Gray McDowell back on nine over. And some news from boxing. Joe Ward was in action last night in uh, Puerto Rico. He was up against Marco Delgado. Do you recognise the name? Well, that is the fighter that Joe Ward fought in his debut when he injured his knee and lost. So Ward won last night comfortably on the judges' scorecards and uh, certainly back up and running and I'm sure happy to get that one out of the way. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks many, Phil. Uh, catch up with you later. Enjoy the football over the weekend. Here is a sense of what's coming up uh, between now and 10 a.m. for you this morning. Alan Quinlan is standing by. Plenty to talk to him about in just a couple of moments' time. Daniel Harris on that United win last night. And uh, obviously the big FA Cup came over the weekend as well. Plenty to chat to Daniel about. We'll have the cold coats coming your way. It's back after a week off at 20 to 9 this morning. Uh, Owen's been chatting with the Ireland international Anna Kaplis and uh, we get her thoughts on a uh, few different bits and bobs there. That's just before 9. Nap of the day from JD uh, in relation, obviously, to the Cheltenham Festival just after 9. And then another fairly shambolic, um, I'm told, crappy quiz at a quarter past nine this morning. So that is all coming your way over the course of this morning. But right now, it is uh, time to turn our attention to the rugby. Quinny, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? Good. So the team obviously is in. We're in a great position this morning. We have actually have a team to talk about. Six changes from the Scotland win. Are you looking at the team that's been picked, uh, thinking that it's been picked to play a certain way, or what are your thoughts on it? Um, well, his hand has been forced a little bit with um, the injury, obviously, to James Ryan in the second row. Um, I personally would have liked to have seen Ryan Baird start, um, give him a chance, throw him in there. But I suppose Ty Byrne, moving him back into the second row, 
and and bring Conan into the back row. You know, that's still a, a strong pack of forwards. Kilcoyne coming in for for Keane Healy. Um, it kind of indicates that uh, he's not looking at, at impact off the bench. He's looking to start this game well, and if Ireland start well, um, it'll instill a bit of confidence and belief into the team and, and um, throw the kitchen sink at it early on. Um, Peter O'Mahony coming on the bench obviously brings a lot of experience. I I, I think Peter with Peter O'Mahony being out for a number of weeks, there was talks that Tyg Bourne would go into the second round, Peter O'Mahony would come in at six. Um, I think Jack Conan... Um, him getting an opportunity at number eight, I, I kind of like that, that scenario. He's he's been involved with the squad for a few weeks now. He came off the bench last weekend, um, and obviously Gary Ringrose is out, so Bundyaki comes back in there, and, and no shock with, with with James Lowe not being picked in the wing. Um, Stockwell has been pretty good, so I think uh, some of the changes have been kind of uh, have um, you know they forced his hand has been forced a little bit, but. It still looks a strong Irish team. Um, wondering what way they'll play. Um, you know, having Gary Ringo has not been the side, it takes away a little bit of that potential uh, X Factor brilliance that he has, that ability to, even though he hasn't had a good Six Nations so far, but it's a strong team, it's a physical team. And um, I think they have to find some way to break England down. I think we've got our tactics wrong a few times against them. The last we've lost the last four. Uh, we've been physically not in the Nations Cup. I think. I think what what happened in the Nations Cup in November, England just were ruthless when they get opportunities and they they punished Ireland and kicked very very well and and we made far too many mistakes in that game and our lineout has let us down against England. So it was very good last week against Scotland, but. They've got to get their set piece right, and um, hopefully they can strike at some stage when they get, when they build some pressure that they can they can take their opportunities. They didn't do that against France. They were battering away for 20, 25 minutes uh, early on in that game, and um, France went up the field and scored and changed the whole momentum of the game. So it's um, it's it's a strong Irish team, and um, they've got to start the game well, I think. Yeah, and speaking of that sort of building up the pressure aspect of it, so do you see just Ander uh, switch to take that one? And we'll talk about him leaving uh, in a little bit. But first of all, just in that positional switch, and he goes to six. Just looking at it last night, Quinny, he's carried more ball than any other player in the Six Nations across all the teams by a mile as well. 64 carries, the next best in the entire tournament is Henshaw with 53. He's in the top 10 of metres made. Is he still going to do that role from six, or will a lot of that fall now to Conan? It'll it'll be both of them. I think um, if Ireland do well in this game, CJ Stander will play well. Jack Connell will play well. Josh van der Fleer will play well. Um, I I think our back row up to this point have played pretty decent. Um, Josh van der Fleer is a, an incredibly talented player, but I think he needs a big game. We we can't expect a result here if our back row are quiet. Um, Billy Vunapola and Tom Curry are. are unbelievable players. They're starters for the Lions um, in a couple of months if it goes ahead. So Ireland have got to try and find a way of, of nullifying them. Curry was outstanding last week. He's just he's a sensational player at the breakdown, but also as a ball carrier, he runs such aggressive lines. And you know, Josh van der Fleer has to match that. He's got to stop him. He's got to run himself with the ball. He's got to be aggressive. Um, they've got to have an edge. And those two players, I think Jack Conan and Josh van der Fleer, are incredibly talented. Um, you know, Josh van der Fleer has been in the Irish team a lot more than Jack Conan, but Jack Conan has never really fulfilled his potential here. I'm a big fan of his. I think he's a, he's a brilliant player. He's played really well at the start of this tournament for Leinster and Pro 14. It is a big step up. But I just love to see him impose himself and be the one swatting players off, making carries, being really aggressive in, in those carries because that's his game. He's he's a very talented player, and if he gets any sort of space, he's very quick. So to answer the question, we need you know Jack Conan and CJ Stander making multiple carries. You know, just because Stander's gone six, it doesn't really nullify or take away from the fact that um, he's not going to make carries because we don't see number eights break off scrums anymore. No one really does that. Um, so Stander is vital to make those hard yards. Hopefully, Conan can get a little bit of space and make some inroads himself. 
you see Conan yeah. as a, a, a midterm option at the number eight jersey, assuming Kellen Doris comes back to, to full fitness pretty soon? Uh, well, it's kind of unfair to say that, but there's there's merit in what you're saying. It's 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 an opportunity for him. If Ireland win this game at on and Jack Conan plays a big game, well, the perception changes. Then we suddenly go, this guy is he's actually international quality. He's been kind of in and out of squads for a couple of years now. He's got a couple of chances and never really taken grabbed that attention, if you like. He's never let the team down or, the, or you know, but he hasn't. He hasn't played regularly enough. He has the ability and the and the talent to play at that level. He's big, he's strong, he's imposing. But the word imposing is is what you want from your number eight. You want him having multiple involvements. And I think Doris has done that since he's kind of started with Ireland. He's he's incredibly talented. Um he's a, a brilliant footballer. And you know, you'd have to imagine that Doris is the one that if we were to select everyone fit and well, that, you know, Doris is in that Irish back row because of his talent and what he can do with the ball and without the ball. Um, so I, that's why I'm saying I'd love Jack Conan to, to kind of put his hand up and say, you know, I've had injuries. I've had setbacks in the last couple of years. I've been, you know, Joe had him in and out of squads. He had him in Australia in 2018. Um, and he's never really grabbed hold of a, of a jersey and people go, he's... You don't, you know, and and I had this myself. Probably you're seen as that someone who can fill a gap, and that you're you're in and out of squads a lot. Um, I think he's potential to be to be closer to the the national side than we've seen. Um, it's a lot of pressure now when you get selected against England, the very good England side who have have dominated us in the last four games. So it's uh, it's a tough ask, and it's it's a little bit unfair that I'm kind of saying that. That's where the, the pressure cooker is at for him. But, you know, Stander is, is obviously it's going to be his last game for Ireland. So there is going to be an opportunity there for maybe, you know, Max Deegan um, to, to put his hand up as well when he comes back playing. Um, but it's a good opportunity for Jack Conan. I really hope he has a big game because I think it's in him. And But he has to have a big game at this level to, to grab that attention, if you like. Is it um, the the you mentioned about how unfair it is? Is there so similar sort of an element to play with Ty Byrne? Quinny, do you think like he's one of our foreign players in the Six Nations this year? One of the foreign players across the tournament must be fancying his chances of. He's certainly thinking about getting a call from Warren Gatland. I would think at some point in the form that he's in, is it a bit unfair on him now as well? Given that there were options for the second row. Yeah, um, um, I, I wouldn't say it's unfair, and I'd say I, I'm sure he doesn't mind. He's He's now, he's now jumped the gun, and he's now seen as an important part of this Irish side, um, and that's where he's at, and that's what I'm talking about, Jack Conan. When you get some big performances, and you're seen as um, a really important player for Ireland, that's the way um, Tyburn is seen now. So I don't know how he feels about playing in the second row, but I think he's been brilliant in the back row for Ireland, and I would have liked to have seen him stay at six for this game. Um, and and Ryan Baird come into the second row. I can fully understand what what they've done, um, and this is. I, I'm just glad that they've they've in moving him to the second row that they've they've kind of brought in the next in line. It's not that Peter O'Mahony isn't a top quality player. He is. The only concern I would have had, and I would I wouldn't have wanted him to put Tyburn in the second row and put Peter in the back row straight away because he hasn't played matches in mm. in over six weeks. I think Conan has been there. He's probably chomping at the bit, and having Peter O'Mahony's experience to come off the bench and be there thereabouts um, is important. But I, I just would have liked to have seen Ty Byrne left where he is. And um, I think a slight concern for me would be the lineout because Henderson, James Ryan, and Ty Byrne have been have worked really well together in in getting up in the opposition ball and you. The, a little bit of that is negated now. I know Jack Conan is very is quite pretty tall himself as a number eight, and they'll use him defensively and offensively. But um, what Ty Byrne has done around the field, and and I was surprised, very surprised, he was taken off last week because he's someone that can come up with a big play. But let's hope he does that. And the reason we probably talk about, you know, we've gone to Quinn Rue before. We've gone for power player in the second row because we're playing England. 
And I'm glad we haven't done that this time. So we've got, we've a very mobile pack and we have struggled physically against them, but we've got a, we've got a hold on to the ball, play with a high tempo and kick very accurately and, 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 you know, match them confrontationally as best we can. We've dominated possession and territory in all the games we've played, but we haven't been anywhere as efficient as we, we can be. So Ireland, you're right across the board, have just to be a lot sharper and, and cut out the turnovers and the mistakes. And, and hopefully we're not talking about the power game afterwards and saying, well, you know, we were a little bit... Like Tyburn is not a is not is not a small man, but he's not a huge second row. He's a very big back row, but he's not a huge second row. And uh, you know they have Charlie Hughes and Atoje who are big and, and powerful. Johnny Hill to come off the bench, so they're they're big men. Um, yeah. But I think right across the board, I, the Irish pack have to be very collective and, and perform together. Well, on that point then about the power game, and that's been spoken about a lot, and you've mentioned it uh, on the show as well over the weeks. And like maybe part of that selection was due to their thirst to have David Kilcoyne, it seems, in the front row over uh, Keane Healy. Obviously, Kilcoyne, a, a dynamic player in the loose, but are we accepting now that we're going to be more vulnerable in the scrum with that switch? And what impact no, will I that don't have? Think, I mean, when you talk about uh, Look, I, I don't think so. I think David Kilcoyne is very experienced now, and I think, um, you know, it's obviously going to be a challenge, and I think uh, Kyle Sinclair will, will fancy his chances against Kilcoyne and, and the English coach Matthew Proudfoot will will probably target him because he hasn't started for Ireland in one of these you know big games for for a while Keen Healy's been ever present and and been brilliant for Ireland but I think some of the reason why he's picked I would imagine is his ball carrying ability you know Keen Healy didn't carry at all last week Herring didn't carry um Ty Furlong made carries and and was brilliant so you have two of your front rows who are not carrying the ball, and that puts a lot of pressure on your back five in the game. So I think I, I, I think bringing Kilcoyne in there gives you Furlong making carries, Kilcoyne making carries, and they're they're very very good carriers. They're powerful. They're dynamic, and you would hope that they they get the opportunity to maybe win that game line, and then that translates Adrian right back right back to your your back five. That hopefully then your second rows are will be next in line and. And then when your back rows do make carries, it doesn't work in that order, if you like, that you're sending your, your front row up first, then your second row, then your back row. But if you have your props making good carries and that the ball is quick and the, the clean out is good, you know, when Stander, when Cone and Van de Fleer or Tyburn get the ball, you would hope that there, there's a bit, little bit of a chaotic, fragmented defence there. But look, sometimes and against England, they're very, very physical and they're very, very good defensively. So... We are going to have to just truck the ball up at times to regenerate the ball and and um, and go through the phases, but it gives you that extra option. But of course, as you said at the start, um, the question is he's got to get his scrummage and right from the word go. I thought our scrumming lineout has been good. Um, you know, making this decision, John Forwardy or Paul O'Connell or Andy Farrell, in 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 their conversations, I think they're impressed enough with Dave Kilcoyne and probably the scrummage they've done in training to and what they've seen in the matches so far to believe he can do get that part of his game right because the ball carrying uh, dynamic ability that he brings is is can be brilliant and can be would be very useful for Ireland on Saturday. On the decision then to start Jacob Stockdale ahead of James Lowe, I think this is something that a lot of people would have seen coming during the week, Alan, that James Lowe wouldn't start this weekend. Is there a little bit of a short-term memory going on, though, when it comes to Stockdale and what he has provided defensively for Ireland? Um, yeah, there is, but he's he's um, he's a very talented player and I think he he has an ability to score tries. And there's always... He, ha he has that... that um, that kudos and that that uh, that ability to do something special with the ball. The concern, of course, and and you can't just forget that. But I'm sure that that it, that information and the coaches in Ulster and the Irish coaches, I'm sure they've given him that information and he's worked on it. Um, and there's a tiny there's some tiny similarities there because again, it's it's just body position, it's aggression and. And it's similar to James Lowe. It's it's not that they don't want the contact or they're they're scared of, of smashing someone. I think it's it's technique. It's it's just having that 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 engine on fired up 
that aggressive kind of intense uh, it, when you don't have the ball and how they defend sensibly as well. You know, Jacob Stockdale, we've seen him before come up and in and the ball go out over his head or he just not number up properly and then just be caught stand, static with with um, with some of his tackles. Um, so I think it's just really important. Look, I, I think he'd be very, very determined and that's sometimes a great place to have a player. It's kind of like Bundiaki coming back into the team. I think they'll be fired up. They've got to do it in a measured way. But, um, you know, I think, of course, Jacob Stockdale is too talented to leave out of the, the Irish side and, and and write him off. But I'm sure he will he will know what he's got to do defensively. And that's the part of the game that he's be, got to be bang on. Because I think England will get a couple of opportunities. And what they've done to us with those opportunities in the past on is they've punished us. Mm. They've just been ruthless. The way they get started the game here two years ago in Dublin with the Johnny May try, then the Elliot Daly try. It's just, it's the way they started. They came to Dublin, they scored after uh, very early in the game with Johnny May. And there was just a kind of an eerie silence in, in the stadium and they were sprinting back full of energy. So even though there's no crowd this time, I think we just can't, it's important that um, Ireland, you know, go out and start the game well. It might not be on the scoreboard because it doesn't work that way that you, you have to go and score all the time and, and uh, for your confidence to, to go sky high. But they've got to come up with a few big defensive plays, a couple of turnovers. They've been they've been excellent at the breakdown. So they've got to force a lot of pressure on England and hope that they they make mistakes. But the worry and the concern here is, look, England probably changed gears last week and we've only seen glimpses of of how good they can be at the, you know, the way they were at the World Cup in that semi-final. I think this... The, the character and the the pressure they put on France last week was was a very high intensity. So I think they they'll they'll be only better um, for that game and getting that win right at the end. So it's it's uh, it's up to Ireland to match that, and they're the ones that that probably are under more pressure to try and get a result. Both sides will be disappointed because, but if you finish losing a game here, it's it's seen as a really bad Six Nations for both sides. We'll we'll see how it pans out, and I, of course neither are kicking teams, Quinny, we're told, so uh, that definitely won't won't be a feature. Uh, what what's your just very briefly before we ask you about CJ Stander? What's your what's going to happen? What's the who's going to win it? Um, I'm optimistic that Ireland will, will um, you know will they, of course you can fault the character this side. I think just tactically they've they've just made poor decisions at times on the field. They've done a, a hell of a lot of good stuff. There's people crying and shouting for more attack, um, more better shape. I, I I would say better shape and attack is what we need. Um, you know, international rugby is tough. You, you don't break teams down easily. But um, I can, a lot of these guys were there in 2018 and, and before that. And they, they brought an efficiency to their whole game that was just wearing the life out of the oppositions. We've seen glimpses of it at times. They've, they've got to be a lot better this week and they've got to beat more defenders. Six defenders beaten last Sunday against Scotland is not enough. Um, and the concern is defensively. So in, when England get that tempo and pace up, they they can break teams down. We missed 22 tackles last week. So Ireland have got to be rock solid. I'm not expecting a game where there's, there's going to be loads of attack here. Both sides kick the ball a lot. But I'm optimistic but fearful that England will, will just have enough to, to get over the line. CJ Stander then, obviously, a shock announcement during the week um, that he was going to be leaving and he was heading back to South Africa, it seems, uh, end of the season. So what's your, um, would you have known, do you know him, Quinny? Would you be fairly that you'd bump in to have a chat with uh, your your sense of him and uh, the loss that will be left behind him? Yeah, I do know him from uh, over the years, from uh, chatting to him and meeting him, in, him on, on many, many occasions. I wouldn't be good friends with CJ because I don't, you know, I don't keep in contact with him. But he's incredibly polite. Everybody has nothing but good, good words to say about CJ Stander, and um, I think he's had a phenomenal, phenomenal run for for Monster in Ireland. Um, you know, his work rate has just been through the roof. I just admire his efforts all the time. You know, he's not the most skillful player. It's not part of his game to be an offloader or. A sidestepper, he loves kind of running out over people and loves the contact. But 
he he he's added to his game over the years, and that's that was that's what got him selected on the, the British and Irish lines in 2017. Um, he was brilliant in that Grand Slam win. You know, he's been involved twice beating the All Blacks. There's there's so many, um, so many accolades there for him to take away with him. Um, it is a shock at, 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 that he's retiring and that he's finishing, and he'll be a loss to Munster in Ireland because I think he's he's. Another area of his game is the breakdown. You know, I think, you know, the turnovers he gets, um, he's been he's been sensational. But, um, you know, he'll be a loss. Uh, his legacy is, legacy is f- pretty firmly intact, and people, in, particularly in Munster, and who know him better and who he's very very who be close to him, they've they've massive respect for the way he turns up and trains and performs consistently. And I think he's done that right from the word go. So. It, 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 it's a big shock, but um, it's an understandable one in a sense. And I know the project player people are, are I, I'm not sure what people want to do, want him to do here, because people are saying, oh, he's going back to South Africa. And the project player kind of jumps up with that scenario. But look, that's where he's from. Um, it's probably a debate for another day and it'll rumble on. It's five years now for project players, but um it, ah, it's yeah, a big shock. He's surprise. not expected to have to spend the rest of his, he's not expected to have to spend the rest of his life there, I suppose, if uh, if that's not not his uh, his wish. Uh, having said that, do you and there's been some uh, very cynical people out there, Quinny, who've been suggesting this week that he might be likely to turn up in a one of the uh, a South African club shirt at some point in the not too distant future. Do you expect that that's him now done, or is there a chance he turns up for the Bulls or one of the teams down there? Well, it could happen. It could happen. I think that's. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm. Don't think there's any evidence to back that up. I think it's speculation. Um, we don't know what way the contract conversations went, um, and whether he was getting offered what he wanted here. I, I've always said this to you before: when when you get contracts and you have stuff on the table, if something, if some, you want to get a contract that turns your head or not, and maybe he's not got the contract that he wants, and his body might be bruised and battered, which is understandable as well. His family are back in South Africa. He'll be a wealthy farmer back in South Africa, and um, I often visualise that, that scenario. Going, you know, if I was him and what he's achieved, to be able to kind of down tools when you're on top of your game and and go back and be, be content in that. It's a lo- it, it'd be a lovely thing place to be for someone. But I think if he pops up playing with the Blue Bulls or one of the South African franchises, I think, well then that'll that'll irk people and. Um, it, it, people won't be happy with that, but again, it's his own business. You know, contracts are they can work both ways. You know, he can be cast aside very, very quickly as well. And there, there's no ownership on CJ Stander. He can do what he wants. But I do hope that we're not having this conversation. That you're not saying to me in six months, well, why did CJ come back out of retirement and why is he playing for the Blue Bulls against Munster, or Leinster in the Rainbow Cup or? Um, I hope that's not the case. But again, it's his own decision, and um, uh, we we just got to take it at face value. And what he says that he's retiring for for those kind of reasons. But if I was any of those uh, provinces there or uh, teams in South Africa, yeah, I think he's he 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 should. You know, the question is, some of them might try and tempt him back out and play again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, that would certainly put a different sheen on the uh, on the statement during the week. Enjoy the rugby over the weekend. We'll listen to you. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks, lads. Thanks a lot, Alan Quinlan, as always, on a Friday, taking us through the uh, weekend's rugby. And what an interesting weekend in store we have as well. It's 8.18 on this Friday morning. Pack show still to come here on OTBM. We're going to be talking uh, football with Daniel Harris in just a couple of moments' time. We have more rugby as well coming with Anna Capeless a little bit later on. John Duggan is going to give us his nap of the day for the Cheltenham Festival. So stay tuned uh, for all of that crappy quiz as well, by the way, coming away before we leave you at 10 a.m. this morning. We're back talking football with Daniel Harris. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. We all talk about what might happen and our hopes and dreams for the day, but that's not real life. Dadcast, Tuesdays from 3 p.m. on OTB Sports Radio. Tune in on the OTB Sports app. 
Get ready for the Cheltenham Festival with the Boyle Sports app, with a special offer guaranteed on every race every day of the festival, plus extra places on each way bets over all four days. The Boyle Sports app has got you covered. Need to study up? Check out our racing post insights or watch our exclusive video previews with Cheltenham Gold Cup winning jockey Robbie Power. The Cheltenham Festival on the faster than ever Boyle Sports app. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie. 18 plus. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Auto Mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, you're welcome back. It's uh, 20 past eight on this Friday morning. We've lots still to come, as you've been hearing there, Anna Capeless coming up with Owen and just a little bit crappy quiz as well before we leave you. Cold cuts too. I mean, everybody's tuned in for that. So that's uh, coming away in just a little bit. Very brief flavour of what's happening across the back pages today, including on otbsports.com. Uh, we'll be marking your card for the uh, latest uh, day at Cheltenham. Tom's trifecta is up there, so you can go and check that out. Some Brian O'Driscoll goodness up there too, obviously with the weekend that's in it. Uh, Gary Neville on the new PFA CEO. Hugo Lloris's comments after the game last night as well as Jose Mourinho. So you can check all of that out up on uh, otbsports.com. And uh, we have some of the papers as well. Needless to say, it's uh, rugby across the board on the Irish Times. Aki relishing his chance to be the physical centre of attention again. And Farrell uh, shuffling his deck there as well. And uh, plenty more besides. We'll give you a bit of a flavour of more of the papers a little bit later on. Yeah, so the big story from last night outside of Jose Mourinho and outside of Spurs was Manchester United getting the job done against AC Milan. Delighted to welcome Daniel Harris to the show now to reflect on that. Good morning, Daniel. Hiya. Uh... So a bit of street smarts, a bit of composure and a bit of quality last night when it mattered for Manchester United. Yeah, I think so. The uh, the quality team obviously made a massive difference because I think what you see when when Pogba doesn't play, United only have one creator really, which is Bruno. And if Bruno's not on, then they have a bit of a problem, particularly because Rashford clearly wasn't fit. So in the first half, you basically had Mason Green were trying to make things happen, and he he looks ready to explode. I mean, he's ticking. You can see it's not. It didn't quite happen for him last night, but he was really the only player you wanted the ball to go to. But then as soon as Pogba came on, then that changed. And what, what you see when when you have a team like United, you have a few quality players, like really high-level players, and then you have some other players who aren't good enough to lift everyone else around them. But if someone else does it, then you'll see better performances from them. And when, when Pogba came on, then you got a much better performance out of Fred in the second half, a much better performance out of Daniel James in the second half, because they're not the players that you can rely on but they're also not players who you can just dismiss as useless. They just they just require the circumstances to be favourable around them. And I think I think what we saw with Pogba was that, particularly without Anthony Martial, United sometimes they, they sometimes struggle to hold the ball. And I think Pogba's obviously his main contribution was a brilliant goal, which was just so so classy. It just really encapsulated what he brought. But also what he gives you is he gives you an, an out ball because if you get the ball into Pogba, and we saw it a lot last night where he can fight off players and, and hang on to it, get you down the pitch and give the defence a breather. And and he did really well in that aspect. And United's defence, they're defending really well at the moment. I wrote at the beginning of the season that their defensive record was better than their defending at the end of the last season. But now they're actually defending properly. They're concentrating. And um, what you're seeing is a lot of clean sheets because they're earning them. I do want to come back to that in a moment, but just to continue on Paul Pogba, how big a factor was his injury in the fall-off title-wise in the Premier League for Manchester United? It was huge. I mean, that's when they were top of the league when Pogba got injured. Mm. They were beating Everton and Pogba got injured. And I mean, it's, it, part of it is specifically Pogba. There are certain things that very few people, if anyone, can do on a football pitch apart from Pogba, and he was playing really well. And part of it is just the structural thing. United, as I said before, they only have one playmaker that's Bruno. They don't have a right winger. And really, they have a good player to play on the right, but not a right winger. And the combination of those factors means they've become more predictable. And it's really strange the way the season's working in that when the team's playing well, they're getting really good value for that form because the games come so quickly. 
But similarly, when there's a drop-off, things can run away from you very quickly, again, because there are loads of games. And that's what happened with United and with Pogba. United don't have an alternative to Pogba. Um, and then even, like Donny van der Beek sat about doing nothing. <laughs> waiting, waiting, I mean, you feel sorry for him, but it's kind of funny also. But he sat around all season waiting for a go. And then as soon as that go might come, he gets injured too. And there's, there's a reason why the team with the biggest squad who can rotate five players every game at top of the league, there's a reason why a team with probably the third best squad who were rotating players, five players every game, are second in the league. And then the second that they stopped being able to do that when they got injuries in attack and injuries in midfield, they started dropping points. And similarly, there's a reason why Chelsea are doing so well now because they can also rotate five players every game. They've probably got the second best squad in the league after City. And what you're also seeing with Chelsea, and I think what you might hope, what you hope you're going to see with Pogba, is that players who haven't played for a bit, and in, whether it's through injury or being out of favour, are quite useful. So what you're seeing with Chelsea is that they've got Rudiger, Pulisic, Ziyech, um, Havertz. They've hardly played this season either because of injury or because Lampard didn't rate them. And then now they're coming back. And when other teams are tired, I mean, I watched Chelsea and Atletico the other night, and the main thing to me wasn't really even that Chelsea's quality was so superior to Atletico, although it was. It was that they were faster to the ball and they were stronger because half their team are fr much fresher. And I think that's what we saw with Pogba last night. I mean, he came on and it was like he'd eaten a mushroom, like in Mario, and everyone else <laughs> had just lost their mushroom. It was just, he looked bigger and more athletic and more at one with the game than everyone else. The game was kind of, he wasn't, he didn't dictate the pace of the game, but when he got the ball, he was just playing at a different speed and with a different physique and a different level to everybody else because he's had to sit down and no one else has. And I mean, Rashford obviously was the most obvious example of that. Like you've seen him just over the past kind of month get weaker and weaker and weaker. I mean, maybe Mario wasn't the best example. It's more like Double Dragon or something where you see that energy bar and it's getting less and less and less. And you can still you can still achieve a knockout. You can still score. You can still do something good to win the game. But um, I mean, and I was almost concerned when um, Solskjaer was interviewed last night and he said, oh, it's just a little thing. Uh, hopefully you'll be okay for the weekend. And you're thinking... That guy needs to not be okay for the weekend, and then he needs to not go away with England, and then you might get Marcus Rashford back. Mm. There might be another one that we come back to, Daniel. The, on the Paul Pogba thing, it was interesting at the end of the game, himself and Sasha with a very warm brace. These two could be brilliant for each other over the years to come. It feels like the way you're talking about Paul Pogba, the conversations about him being sold are now finished. Uh, I don't know about that, because if Pogba wants to go, then I think Pogba will probably go. I think my main problem with Pogba now isn't really is is because United are good. But Paul Pogba is a brilliant player to have. The problem for me with Pogba is how many games he misses. He's just missed six weeks. He missed almost all the last season, and he he seems to miss quite a significant amount every 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 season. And there's no reason to particularly think that's going to change. Now, if Donny Van de Beek becomes a viable second creator, or United buy a right winger who can do that, or um, uh, Ahmad Diallo can do that, then then it's then you can you don't necessarily need to exactly rely on Paul Pogba because you've got alternatives to do the job that he might do. But if someone came in and offered offered you a, an amount of money that enabled you to buy a replacement, I'd still think about it, not because I don't think that Paul Pogba. Paul Pogba is a brilliant player. I mean, it would be hard to go away and find someone as good as Paul Pogba. But if Paul Pogba is injured, he's absolutely useless. And he is he is getting in. He does seem to spend quite a lot of time not playing. And that is problematic. So I would definitely, if I got an offer for Paul Pogba, I'd think about it for that reason. But otherwise, um, yeah, I mean, what we saw last night was great. And if we saw it, see more of that, then that would be also great. He was Solskjaer's only substitute last night, Daniel. Does Solskjaer use his bench enough? Uh, I think you can sometimes criticise him for who he brings off and who he brings on. So he used a lot of this season, it seems to be that the way he's used his bench has been based on some level of seniority rather than what's going on on the pitch. So if he wants to bring on a striker and he wants to take off a striker, it's generally... Um, Mason Greenwood, who's gone, and Anthony Martial, who's gone off, even though Greenwood's generally been playing better than Martial. So I think you can criticise him for that, but ultimately, if you're hanging on to a 1-0, 
away from home in San Siro. And I know this isn't the Milan of Saki, but they're not a terrible team. And you're still like you, if you're hanging on to a one in San Siro and you're doing so pretty comfortably, I would be loath to make any changes. And why, why would you? Things, things were going nicely. And I actually think with Ole, and not just with Ole, actually, but with the managers that preceded him, they would often, when defending a one-goal lead, start taking off strikers and bringing on defenders. And that invites pressure on a defence that isn't... Is a, it's a getting better as a defence, but it's not It's not Brown, Vidic, Ferdinand, Evra, where you feel like you could probably invite pressure and they'll handle it. So if it looks like things are going well, then... I mean, what, what changes are you going to make there? It wasn't like he had loads of options on the bench. Dan James is someone you might bring on when you're defending a lead because you want his ability to get you down the pitch. But he's already on. He's already there. And you didn't have Anthony Martial. He might be someone you might bring on because he holds the ball up well. He can hang on to it. He can dribble. takes time out of the game. wasn't available. So it wasn't like there were that many options on the bench. So really, the only options you've got are to start bringing on defensive players for attacking players. And... I really like the way United got after it and they were still trying to score goals at the end because that is ultimately the best way of keep the best way of stopping the opposition from scoring is keeping the ball down the other end. And that definitely is the best way of doing so with the players that United have. So although you want players to be rested, one that up in a knockout European tie away at AC Milan probably isn't the time to be doing that, even though you might want to. So, so talk us through where you see this defence going then. Uh, Lindelof and Maguire, pretty good last night to say the least. Three goals conceded by Manchester United now in the last 11 games. And you've got a goalkeeper now who uh, is really staking a claim to keep David De Gea out of the side. Uh, is this trending in the right direction, coming from a pretty high base, actually, if you look at those last 11 games? Um, yeah, that, it's not it's not as good a defence as you would like. They're, they're always probably, you'll always probably feel that they've got some mistakes in them. But what is, what is pleasing to see is the coherence of the way that they're defending. And when that doesn't happen, the way that they're throwing themselves in the way of things, which wasn't always the case. And that combination of factors is making them quite a good defence at the moment. I, I mean, I, it looks a lot like Ole wants a centre-back. Obviously, that centre-back would be to play instead of Lindelof, who was brilliant last night. And that is the thing with... with the, so a lot of the players that United have at the moment, the top level is a good level but their bottom level or their, the, the level that they produce most frequently isn't high enough. And, I mean, if I was looking at ways to strengthen, I would want the centre-back, but it's not where I'd start. I think it's where Ole's going to start. I think that he's. I think that if you have the opportunity to buy Alfinger Haaland, and who knows whether that... Not Alfinger Haaland, um, other Haaland. <laughs> Erling, Erling Brute Haaland. They might get if you have the opportunity actually. to buy him, then, then obviously every other transfer plan that you have, you need to put to one side. Because even if you think that that isn't the area that needs most needs addressing in the team, where if you can sign a player that good, then you just have to do it because it changes everything. But other than that, it seems a lot like Ole's priority is a centre back. I I would like a centre back who's better than Lindelof, and because I don't think that ultimately Lindelof is good enough. But I think that if you got the rest of the team right, you could probably win the league with that defence. And so I would be looking at a midfield player, a midfield player to play as a number six. So that would be that would be my priority because I also think that if you had that, if you had someone who could control the tempo and who could control the area in front of the back four, you would concede fewer goals and the defence would have to would be put under less pressure. But yeah, the, the defending is is looking really good and you can see that they've done some work on the training ground and that they've thought about what to do because the way that they're operating as a unit is better, but the way that they're taking responsibility as individuals is much better as well. And they're good players. They're just they're not always the best combination for each other because Lindelof and Maguire both lack pace, so they can't really cover each other. And and Juan Bissaka doesn't give you doesn't give you much going forward, which is difficult if you don't have a right winger. But it is it is looking much better than it has. And as I said, like last season, they can see quite they didn't concede many goals in the run in, but that didn't really look that much about good defending and that much about organisation and responsibility. It just, sometimes it goes like that. This time, it looks much more like what defending is meant to look like. About 20 minutes in, there was a good snapshot of events at the other end of the pitch where Luke Shaw made a brilliant run forward, gets to the, the end line and cuts the ball back and uh, Rashford and Greenwood aren't even in the shot. They're, they're miles back. And it was a good snapshot, I think, of where United are at from an attacking point of view and the injuries notwithstanding, which is a further headache. Where are the? It's been an issue for them, obviously. Where are the goals going to come from now over the next number of weeks? 
so what the thing I most enjoyed about the goal was that I think there were six people in the box and one player just outside. And that is that's going to make a lot of difference. Now, before the game, oh, they said that um, we can't sit back and soak up the pressure. We know we're better when we go forward. And he talks, he says that kind of thing a lot and you don't always see it on the pitch. So I don't know if it's because the players aren't, don't have the confidence to do it, aren't doing it, or he's giving them instructions that are stopping that from quite happening in the way that he would like. But I think the problem is that when Cavani doesn't play, they don't have a player who makes the centre-forwards runs. Even Mason Greenwood, who is a, who's going to grow into a really high-level centre-forward, he doesn't get a lot of tap-ins at the front post. And that is where you get the majority of your goals at the front post. Fergie always used to say that. Um, he's looking to put, he's looking to peel off for the cutback so that he can smash one in or place one in from kind of like 10, 10 to 15 yards. Um, so they do need... I mean, I know they've done a lot of work with Anthony Martial on making those kind of runs, and Marcus Rashford needs to make them from the other side as well. And I think we're going to see more of those now that he doesn't have to spend as much time on the touchline because he's getting a lot more help from Luke Shaw and Polka's coming back. So that area of the pitch is going to be spoken for. So I hope we're going to see. I hope we're going to see more of that, more, 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 more of the wide players coming in because United score a lot of really good goals, and they don't score enough crap goals, and. That's been the case for quite a long time. Like, if you look at Marcus Rashford, scored whatever he scored, like 15, 16 goals a season. Can't remember what it is. He hasn't scored very many crap ones. And those goals are there. And you're right in what you say that where are the goals going to come from? They haven't exactly struggled for goals, but they're not as replete with them as they should be with their forward lines. And I think, I think one of the things that will make a difference is getting the right player on the right hand side which we've seen too much of Rashford playing there, of, um, of Daniel James playing there. And I know Daniel James does a good job for the team when he plays there because he, he's really good, he enables the press. But whether it's Greenwood or Ahmad or someone new, I think next season, if they can get someone to play that position, you'll also see them find it easier to score because at the, at the moment, the teams know that most of the action is going to come down the left. So if they focus their defence on that side then United are going to struggle to get something from the other side. So it's about finding the right the right player or picking the right player to play on that right. But as I said at the beginning, it's also about getting more players to attack the box. And I was heartened by, by what I saw when they scored that first goal uh, last night because when you have six men in the box, that enables you to win the ball back even in the box like Fred did. And it means that you're very hard to mark. And when the ball's bobbling about, it's much more likely to fall to a player on the United's team. So Manchester United now, Daniel, probably favourites to win the Europa League. They've got Leicester City this weekend in the FA Cup. And Solskjaer said this week that winning trophies can sometimes be an ego thing. Uh, it, would it be more than that to win either of those trophies this season? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think he he's also said things that appear contradictory, that it's important to win a trophy and... When he was in the team that won the League Cup in 2006, that squad, it made a big difference in, in convincing them they could go on and win the league next season when they hadn't won it for a couple of years. And, I, and, and he does know that. I think what he's saying is that if you lose a cup game against another good team, it doesn't mean that you're not developing. It doesn't mean you're not progressing. It doesn't mean you're not a good team. And I think that is fair. But winning big games is important for the development of a team. And I'm sure this team... Having gone to the San, having gone to San Siro and needing to win and won, I'm absolutely certain that will help. That will give them a boost to their confidence. Um, and so with winning, so with winning either or both of the cups. I mean, when you say that the team's favourite for a cup, it, I mean, it doesn't mean that much. You can easily see United losing over losing to Arsenal or losing to Roma. They they find it difficult to play against Arsenal actually. And they're the, they're, I'd say of all the teams. They're the team against whom they find it hardest to play because they press from the front and sit deep. And those are two things that this particular team find it quite hard to cope with. I mean, they're a better team than Arsenal. I mean, they're a much better team than Arsenal. You just need to look at the league table. But Arsenal's top level is an, is an all right level. And if United don't produce anything close to their top level and those teams play, they could easily lose that tie. They could easily lose a final to that team. They could easily lose to Roma too. And it depends what United you get because... They are still capable of playing badly. I, I felt like against Milan, watching the first leg, it felt it reminded me a bit of when United you know, played Porto in 2009, where they came to Old Trafford and they played really well and they still didn't win. 
And I was quite confident about United last night because it felt like Milan had played pretty much as well as they could play at Old Trafford. And they still needed a last minute injury time goal from a set piece and a goalkeeping mistake to not win. And that's sort of the standard of the teams, I think, that are left. That even if they play really well, United could still be good enough to beat them, but they might not be. And as for the cup, the cup is really important, I think, because City could still win everything. And it's United's duty to defend the treble that they won in 1999 and to stop that from happening. But the teams that are left in the cup, United could lose to any of those pretty much. Um, so the ability to go on and win something would represent a step forward because they keep losing semi-finals. Another way of looking at it is to say that they've reached the quarterfinals of every cup competition they've been in since Solskjaer became manager, which is quite a good record. But it also means that you're then going to play some big games and you're then going to lose them. Whereas if you're losing earlier, no one would really be saying all that much. Mm. So they do they do need to start winning some big games. I mean, they have won some big games, but they could they could do with winning one of these two competitions, ideally the FA Cup, but they've got to play Leicester, who have found some form, and Leicester are a good team. And that should be a really good game. Looking forward to that one. But if United play badly, then they'll lose. Yeah. Uh, just one last thing, Daniel, on the probably the bigger story last night is the meltdown of Tottenham Hotspur uh, in Croatia. How do you see these next few months going for Jose Mourinho and Tottenham Hotspur? Um, it's hard to know because it, it looked like they were starting to get good again over the last few weeks. They are starting to win some games. He decided to pick Gareth Bale. And amazingly, it turned out that Gareth Bale was good at football, which was a massive turn up for the books. Um, and they looked like a team who'd be hard to defend against. And he was starting to play the kind of team that the, the difficult to play against because not they weren't sitting back so much anymore. They had Harry Kane, Son and Gareth Bale. That's three players that can really hurt you. And then Ndombele too. But their defending is not good. And you start to wonder because Mourinho ought to be able to organise a defence. And perhaps this defence is just not good enough. And he just needs to go and buy three defenders but then he bought Matt Doherty and he's, he's, he's done nothing and the centre-backs are starting to cost him I mean last night was one of those performances you sometimes see from a team where it sort of looks like everyone's tossed it off and that is a bad sign and it could easily be dressed up as Mourinho chucking his players under the bus in the way that people like to say he always does but on, though they didn't look like a particularly well-organised team what are you going to do? Like the players have gone out there and the players have gone out there tuning up from the first leg against Dinamo Zagreb and they've managed to get themselves beaten 3-0. And what are you meant to say? I don't see why you should, I don't see why you should let the players get away with that. Um, it, I don't know what political capital he's got in the dressing room. So maybe the players have had enough of him and that was a we've had enough of you kind of performance. Or maybe the players will look at themselves and say, you know what, he was right and Hugo Lloris was right. And we are a bunch of morons, and that was completely unacceptable. Or maybe it'll be a bit of both. I don't know. But watching the performance, I didn't see the interviews afterwards and think Mourinho is out of order here. He might also be responsible, and maybe he should wants to take some responsibility himself. But you can't toss the two goal lead and expect your boss to say, "Well done, that was all on me." Like, and people always say that Alex Ferguson never chucked his players under the bus. It's absolute nonsense. And literally, just before I came on air, I was doing some on this day. I do on this day United for my podcast, United Rewind, every day. And on this day in 1995, United lost 2-0 at Anfield. But Peter Schmeichel had maybe the best game that I ever saw him have. It could have been 8-0 if it wasn't for him. And Fergie's interview afterwards, he said, "We're absolutely dreadful today." And he didn't say I was dreadful. We blame the players because ultimately the players are out there. The players haven't put it in. The players haven't turned up. And it's okay to do that. But if you don't have the political capital to do that, then it might not work. And Fergie obviously had that. We don't know that about Mourinho. But I guess we're going to find out because they've got some big games coming up. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that sums it up nicely, the political capital aspect of it. Daniel, thanks a million as always. No, have a good day, everyone. See you again. Cheers. Thank you, Daniel Harris, on the line there, uh, talking all things uh, United and uh, such an interesting, and Jose Mourinho, an interesting story to watch over the next while, which we will do. And by the way, uh, stay tuned to Off the Ball over the weekend. Coming your way tomorrow, John Duggan in the presenter's chair for OTB Saturday. It's on the air from one o'clock on News Talk. And from half past one, we have a very special uh, panel where we're talking about racism in sport 
and uh, given events uh, with uh, Rangers last night, probably no more appropriate time to be talking about it. Darren Randolph, Jason Sherlock and Des Tomlinson from the FAI, who's the Inter-Culture uh, and National Strategy Coordinator with the association, will be along to discuss that. Uh, that's from 1.30 uh, tomorrow on News Talk and tuned in for that. Uh, from 3 o'clock uh, for a couple of hours, it'll be Football Saturday. As always, David Myler, Johnny Ward and Dan McDonald. Uh, Johnny JD for that. And then over on Sunday, the uh, newspaper review, uh, Shane Hannon will be in the presenter's chair. George Hamilton and Rory O'Connor will be uh, as guests this week for the newspaper review there. And then from three o'clock live Premier League commentary, it'll be West Ham against Arsenal in the company of Stephen Doyle and Brian Kerr. So that's all coming your way on Off the Ball over the weekend. Tune into News Talk tomorrow, uh, kicking things off from one o'clock. But it is that time of the week where we serve you up our coldest takes of the week. as stony cold as the chances of an Ireland winger making a try-saving tackle anytime soon. It's Cold Cuts. I am flabbergasted. Maguire. And they're here. Shocking. I am I'm disgusted. Maguire. And they're here. Get close to people. Move your feet. Move your feet. Maguire. De Gea. I am flabbergasted. I'm not too happy with all that. No. Maguire. Why would be swinging punches at that guy? De Gea. Swinging punch, swinging punch, swinging punch, swinging punch. Maguire. And De Gea. I'm fuming here watching this game of football. All right. It is uh, cold cuts. And number four this week was a late, late entry from the Europa League last night. I mean, we had to include it. It was Jose Mourinho uh, driving the bus last night and certainly not afraid to drive it over and back over his players. I told the players uh, the risks of a bad attitude. I told the players at half time, even with 0 0, uh, the risk of um, playing the way we were, we were playing. And um, it happened. Uh, because I believe that the players only realised that the game was um, in risk when uh, they scored the second goal and went to um, to extra time. Actually, I do disagree with Daniel Harrison on that one. I, I, I think it's incredible that a manager like Alex Ferguson had so much kudos in the bank that he could get away with him whatever the hell he wanted, whereas Jose Mourinho has just signed his uh, exit note. Uh, maybe. I, I don't know. Like, I mean, uh, Jose Mourinho has given us great insight this season through his Instagram account. And uh, he's maybe players are, are looking at that throughout the season as well, thinking, what the hell is this guy doing on, on Instagram? And sometimes having digs at the players via Instagram as well. Uh, like, I, I, I do wonder what they think of, of Jose coming out and, and having a pop at him. Because on the outside looking in, I think it's fair game. This guy's a legend, a legendary manager, and uh, he can kind of say what he wants. And I mean, he got good performances out of them at the start of the season. They haven't repaid that over the last uh, couple of months with, with anything resembling that. So uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of split. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not, I'm not really sure about that. I think you can reverse that bus and drive it over them again. <laughs> can they take any more? Is the question. In at number three this week, Frank Bruno, the former heavyweight champion of the world and all-around legend. Let's face it. He's been wishing us a happy Paddy's Day. And there's a real Paddy's Day theme to the next few of these. Uh, and he's been pointing out that it's the only corner of the UK over here that he hasn't been booked for a gig for in 25 years. Look, at I know what you're thinking. It's too long. So much you get him booked once this entire shitstorm is over. But his mentions were a mess. And uh, we can take a look at those. Coach McLean called him out on. Uh, Owen Mullen uh, weighed in with some, you know, more hefty... Well, I mean, look, it was a nuanced point about what, you know, likely referencing Northern Ireland. But it is social media, right? So it properly kicked off after that. Lyndon... No, actually, that was... Linda was pretty reasonable there. And I won't agree. And then by the end, everyone just wanted to meet up and go for a beer. I mean, social media is a scourge. Jose Mourinho, own, it turns out, should be more like social media. Nuanced uh, and absolutely. reasonable. Good, good, good things happen on social media is the bottom line here. And uh, Number two in cold cuts this week is Justin Trudeau. I know, I know. Cold cuts. Uh, we generally try to steer uh, dear politics, but we couldn't ignore the Canadian uh, PM this week who, while attempting to spread the love across the Atlantic, he went a little bit Steve McLaren on us. We march in parades. We wear our favourite green outfits, maybe have a Guinness or two, and we recognise the contributions that Irish Canadians have made and continue to make in our communities. Irish culture and heritage has long been a part of our Canadian fabric. Thomas Darcy McGee, one of our founding fathers, emigrated from Ireland. My friends, we will get through this together. Better days are ahead, and that's worth celebrating. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. 
Thomas Darcy McGee, by the way, that is not a real person. There is no, that's somebody made up, they got off, that name is not, that person never existed, I would offer. And to be fair, I would have to say, Owen, I'd have to put my hands up on this one. It's far less Begab and Begara than I had uh, pictured it when I uh, listened to it, for the, watched it for the first time at about six o'clock on Paddy's Day, when there was more than one glass of wine on board. I'm not going to lie, I'm going to hold my hands up on that. I like just put it this way, the chances of you addressing the Canadian public and not putting on some sort of Canadian twang is zero to nil. It's all it's always gonna happen and I, I appreciate the effort on this front, but uh very Steve McLaren. And also, by the way, clearly spending far too much time with new Canadian uh, Kevin Caban was the other point I would say about uh, both Thomas Darcy McGee and Justin Trudeau. Number one. And come on, look at as a nation, we've given out about accents right here now. And as a nation, have we not really had enough of those North Americans and their Paddy's Day and their four Irish accents? Hey guys, uh, Graham McDowell here. Um, just wanted to say a very big happy St. Patrick's Day. And more importantly, 100 years of golf, which is incredible to all the St. Anne's members, uh, one of my favorite parts of the world. Uh, wishing you all a very great and safe golfing year this year and uh, raising a pint to you uh, to the future uh, 2021 and the good that's in store. Slauncher from me and all my friends at Guinness. Well, look, Graham can basically get away with it. I mean, he's pr he's almost Irish anyway, Owen, so I mean, he can get away with putting on that sort of faux accent and it's always good to hear from the great man as well. What about that pint, by the way? Let's take a look at that pint. It's like a surge pint without the surge. It's literally the flattest pint I've ever seen. It, there's almost no head on it. Uh, yeah, it's a, oh, wow. I'm, it's just after coming up on my screen here. Oh, that is that is a tiny, tiny head uh, from Graham sure. McDowell. You, like, I mean, clearly just hasn't been back here enough to actually know how it's how it's properly done. That is hashtag shit London Guinness, even though it's uh, a million miles away from London. And that's hashtag cold cuts. I am flabbergasted. McGuire. Here. Shocking. I am I'm disgusted. Warrior. And they're here. Get close to people. Move your feet. Move your feet. Move your Warrior. feet. And they're here. I am flabbergasted. I'm not too happy with all that. No. Warrior. I would be swinging punches at that guy. They're here. Swinging punch, swinging punch, swinging punch, swinging punch. Warrior. And they're here. I'm fuming here watching this game of football. Uh, 10 to 9 on this Friday morning. The sting is always going to be the best thing about that item, let's say. So here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio over the course of the day. Uh, from half past 10 this morning for the final time this week, the Cheltenham Show on OTB Sports with Paddy Power is going to be live. Don't feel like a punter, feel like a favourite this Cheltenham. And you can check all of that out and get your card marked from half past 10. We'll also be marking your card for the football of the weekend. That's uh, half past 1. The Paddy Power half hour will be coming your way there. It's Nathan this week with Enda. And uh, again, giving you all the best stuff ahead of the weekend. Three o'clock, Friday Night Racing uh, will be live from four. It's Team uh, 33, League of Ireland legend. This week, it's Tony Sheridan in the hot seat there. Emmanuel Petit is the subject of OTB Gold from six and then off the ball, live in your radio from seven o'clock this evening. But right now here in OTB AM, we've been chatting to the Ireland rugby back row, Anna Capeless. Owen spoke to Anna on Wednesday around the Tackle Your Feelings campaign uh, by Rugby Players Ireland. They're uh, you're urging everybody to be kind this weekend on social media. Okay, delighted to welcome Anna Capeless to the show. She's an Ireland international and Harlequins rugby player. You were on with us last week, or last month, I should say, as well. Anna, you're very welcome back to the show. How are you getting on? Yeah, very well, thanks. Um, still loads of roller coasters, even since I spoke to you last. So uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll get into them. But yeah, thanks for having me. Good to be back. One of the main roller coasters, I'd imagine, has been with regards to the Six Nations this year and whether or not it would be played, when it was going to play, be played, and I guess it's ended up being three weeks from now. So how has the last few weeks been from that standpoint, going from not knowing to then preparing for a Six Nations that is on your doorstep in April? Um, that was very welcome. And I think that uh, with all the uncertainty around COVID at the time of you know preparing in January, with the numbers rising and everything else, it almost... It was almost uh, comforting to have it. Okay, let's just let's just push it off and do it then, you know, and, and be given a date so that you know we could be more certain around, um, you know, the cases coming down and lockdown having an effect to to maybe you know 
uh, make travel safer again and um, things like that. So um, the, what kind of happened in the meantime then? So we were going from, we were coming from a place of preparing for um, Six Nations in February and then World Cup qualifiers after that to then having that swapped around to preparing first for World Cup qualifiers and then for Six Nations. Since that, and we were preparing for that as well, the World Cup was postponed, therefore the World Cup qualifiers were postponed as well. So a lot of shuffling around, um, a lot of coming very close to, to game time, like we, we should have been in, in Spain last weekend, you know, playing Spain in a World Cup qualifier. And it was... Um, you know, it wasn't long before that selection was was going to be made that uh, that was, you know, that call was made from the World Cup. And it was very, um, very disappointing that week to get that announcement. And I think a lot of people were saying, you know, God, how could you have expected, you know, a World Cup to go ahead in a year like this? But if you can't kind of half, you can't half prepare, you can't kind of half think that something is going to go ahead. So if someone's given us a date, we'd be like, yeah. You know, we're 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 preparing for that, and that's um that's you know all all guns blazed for for that um fixture. So, um you know we're preparing for the Six Nations now with with that same hat on, and you know despite the disappointment of you know having the World Cup postponed, we still we've still got a massive job to do, and you know we're looking forward to playing the Six Nations finally, and it'll be nice to play like Six Nations with some nicer weather, you know, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully no like snowstorms in, in, in Scotland or wherever we, we, we go to play, you know, so um, that'll, be, that'll be interesting. Yeah. The interesting thing as well is how you try and deal with this with a team that isn't on, say, England's level of professionalism. Um, and I just pull England out of there because they're obviously the ones that have got the head start in the Six Nations when it comes to a, a fully professional team. Does mm -hmm. that make it harder uh, on your perspective, knowing that you've got the added complications of some of your players having to go to work and trying to get time off and not knowing essentially when you're playing games? Yeah, that's challenging anyway, outside of COVID. So throwing COVID in the mix where, you know, players may have to quarantine, meaning that you may have to request from your employer more time off or could I work remotely those days or that week yeah that that makes it certainly challenging um so uh an extra element of you know not being professional um in in this day and age you know it throws another you know another spanner in the works um so you know we're striving to improve and put in those performances that um you know, will eventually get us to that professional level and, you know, to have, so, you know, this extra, extra challenge for sport and just, you know, for, for everyone, you know, sport aside, for everyone in life, you know, to have COVID, you know, to take away so many things and challenge you on so many different levels. Um, it has been, you know, difficult for, for, for women's rugby because, you know, the, the, the financial hit that there are a few have taken and any, any rugby union has taken, you know, um, we obviously rely on, uh, on the union to, to support us and we've had like phenomenal support from our management and backroom staff to make sure that our camps can go ahead. So we are incredibly lucky um, on, on many levels. Like we, you know, when, the, when it was announced that the World Cup would be postponed, you know, we we're all very shocked and disappointed. And But we still haven't, we're still not taking for granted how lucky we are. You know, you, you look around and there's, you know, the, the, the GAA pitches and clubs are empty and any rugby, any club rugby, you know, it's not going ahead. We, we haven't taken for granted how lucky we are that, you know, the IRFU is, is supporting us and, and we're able to get to camps and get to training and, and prepare for games, whether those games went ahead or not. In the end, we were still aiming to prepare for games that other athletes haven't been able to do. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like a bit of a vicious cycle, what you mentioned there, the professionalism, that to become professionalism, you might feel that better performances are needed, but by not being professional, those chances of actually putting in those better performances are hindered. 100%. So, yeah, so where does that leave you? So, you know, if, if you can't, you know, and, and, and professionalism hasn't, you know, come, come for us yet, so how do you how do you strive towards those performances? You know, we we have to, you know, conversations like this, like you and I are having now, growing the game, growing the awareness of the game will grow the participation, will grow the bums and seats. That's what will that's what'll get us there 
to a level. Like there's a million different ways of doing it, you know, to get us to that professional level. But that's something that, that this, this bit is easy. You know, you and I talking now, like this is easy for us to, to, to grow the game. Like I'll use my, my profile, like my, my social media, which is, you know, this like instant marketing that every single player has. And, you know, we all use it in a very uh, res responsible way, but it is a way of, you know, reaching out to like younger girls that want to get into the game that see us playing and see my teammates and what where they're from and what they do. And that's that this free platform that we can use to get, you know, girls playing, get people along to the games, you know, when when that happens. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's there's still positives, you know, to, to, to take and to grow on. Is WXV a positive? Uh, announced obviously this week the new global format that I guess places added importance on finishing higher up in the Six Nations. Yeah, definitely. Is that what it's called? I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> well, wor World 15 is what I assumed it was, but uh, in a quick right. info video, uh, the voiceover referred to it as WXV. Um, so Ooh. I think possibly, I don't take my word for it, but uh, that, that's certainly what it was referred to in the video. I haven't seen the video yet and I just had a quick flick through my Instagram there and could see, yeah, people sharing it and talking about it, but I hadn't heard it called that. And I said, that's, yeah, that's interesting. That's cool. Hopefully that's a tournament that will become like a, a household name, just like Six mm. Nations or anything like that. So, um, yeah, really great announcement to read this morning. Really nice surprise, like, you know, especially off the back of the kind of spiral of, of disappointing announcements this year. Um, so yeah, really, really exciting. And like you say, placing massive importance on the Six Nations and the, the results, you know, it's not just for pride now or for, you know, just a, a world ranking, but just, you know, outside of, a, you know, World World Cup year, it doesn't really have much of an effect on, on, on what what you do. You know, it, it places massive importance on, on every result in the Six Nations and you know the the try count and the bonus points and, and things like that so we'll have to look at how we'll achieve those and not just going for a win but going for tries and going for um even if you had to a losing bonus point you know um like like so many teams do in the Six Nations that makes it very interesting. Yeah for sure and when you talk about everything that you said a, a couple of moments ago about trying to, to grow the chances of Ireland's getting professional or increasing standards, a global game, a more global game is not going to, to harm that in any way. Definitely. And, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of teams, a lot of women's teams around the world um, are kind of in the shadow of their men's, the male counterparts, you know, because the male counterparts might have, um, you know, achieved, you know, their, their status first you know and the, and the women's team kind of has, has come afterwards if you look at Canada as an example you know their women's team led the way and they're a better more successful side than their men's counterparts so it's only right that someone like Canada gets to perform on a world stage year in year out all of us I'm just you know I mean I'm using Canada as an example there of, sure. of someone that's kind of different you know we all deserve to have that platform that world platform year on year and not just the Six Nations so um that's, you know, that'd be huge for Southern Hemisphere teams that don't have a tournament like the Six Nations and um, just, you know, they organise their own friendlies or a little test series, but that's not a consistent thing. You know, every year it's like, okay, who are we going to play next year? And now with the, you know, commitment from South Africa to throw their hat in the ring in a very serious manner, you know, and build with, with the appointment of Lynn Cantwell as their, like, you know, d director of women's rugby down there. I uh, hope I've used the right title. <laughs> For her, for her role there, but that, that's essentially what it is. Like that's massive for her and massive for Southern Hemisphere rugby. And and um, yeah, like it, it, you're right. It can it can only mean positive things. One last thing before we let you go, and I just on this weekend, Ireland against England, massive news this week that CJ Stander is going to retire. I was going to ask you actually about how Peter O'Mahony's return would affect the Irish back row, but I wonder, does the coaching team already start to look a little bit further down the track when it comes to their selection even this weekend? Even for this weekend, maybe. I think it's, we're all um, struggling to see into the mind of Andy Farrell at the mm. moment, you know, but I actually, I think that, um, You know, as 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 an Irish, the, the Irish men's team. How I felt as an Irish men's team supporter in the last few years is that we aim for 
big performances and big results in the years between the World Cups. And then when it comes to, to a World Cup, it doesn't, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's the other teams who appear to have just been coasting along, coasting along in the years in between that uh, perform at the, at the World Cup. And I just, I would love to see the, the guys do well in, in a World Cup and, and they, they deserve that. So would you, you know, someone... You know, there's a lot of talk around like Johnny Sexton and you know the older players like wondering if they'll make it to a World Cup. Should they, you know, start to should you start to open the doors behind them and see what's coming through? But you know, you still want to you still want to do well in the Six Nations and especially against England. And you know, if if CJ Stander is you know going to retire in, in in the summer. Um, do you give him, you know, do you give him those opportunities to play? Or do you start, you know, you know, messing around and 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 bringing in new guys? And not like Ireland is any shortage of like unbelievable back rows to like fill his spot. Um, it's it'll be an interesting one. And I don't think one is a right decision over the other at the moment, you know, with with still a, a bit of time to build towards the World Cup. Like I'd love to see CJ, you know finish out his career in the way that he would like which is you know just big carries big hits big turnover moments like I think he deserves that and um, I think that the team around him can learn from that and build off that and whoever is going to come in to to fill his boots will want to like we always say leave the jersey in a better place and then pick it up and bring it on even further so it'll be interesting to see um how, how that rolls out for for cg over the next few months and and what andy farrell will decide to do yeah it, it will it's a, it's a fascinating question uh, mm -hmm. anna it's been great chatting to you once again best of luck with the next few weeks and hopefully it's a successful six nations campaign thanks a million i'll chat to you again soon otb am this is OTB Sports Radio. Off the ball. Into the box, Hildegard. It was a first time shot with his left foot from about 10 yards out. Now he's got his first in the Premier League. It's Arsenal 1, Tottenham Hotspur 1. Tenth visits fifth in the Premier League this Sunday, and we'll have full live match commentary on Off the Ball as Arsenal travel across London to West Ham. Brian Kerr and Stephen Doyle will call the game for us. George Hamilton and Rory O'Connor will go through the back pages in the paper review, and we'll reflect on Ireland's final Six Nations clash against England. Off the ball. Don't miss a moment of the action every weekend from 1 p.m. on OTB Sports Radio. Listen live on the OTB Sports app. Well, I'm wondering if this is going to be my week. Uh, four winners, three seconds, uh, second place in the last race every single day, including the 33 to 1 shot yesterday. But it might not be my week, and that's just the way it goes. But we'll give it a shot one last day at the Chatland Festival. The sun rose in the east today. It is a new day, it is a clean slate. The nap of the day, folks at Plutar in the Gold Cup at 3.05. Rachel Blackmore has one of these amazing weeks. It should be global news. It should be all across the world what Rachel Blackmore is doing right now. She rides this horse for Henry de Bramhead. Seven-year-old at Plutar won the Savile Chase at Leperstown at Christmas with a brilliant staying performance to deny Kenboy and Mellon that day. Uh, has been a really good two-miler as well, beat Pachac and Persuas. Has won at the festival before. Third in the Ryanair Chase last year. I think this could be the horse at three to one to lower the colour of Album Photo. If Album Photo does it and wins three Gold Cups, well, you can't say anything about that. He's been a brilliant servant to William Mullins and Paul Tennant and the Donnellys, the connections in Carlo. We also have Champ for the home team with Nicky Henderson and uh, J.P. McManus's ownership. And Manella Indo, I wouldn't rule that horse out with Jack Kennedy riding so well. And Ken Boy as well, the Irish uh, Gold Cup winner. Maybe the course might not suit Ken Boy, but 12 runners going to post for the Gold Cup, one of the blue uh, ribboned uh, events in National Hunt Racing at 3.05. Can't wait for that one. The rest of my tips are now on OTB Sports. So otbsports.com and on the OTB app. Thanks to Paddy Power Charity Bet for the final day. Always go each way and uh, never gamble more than you can afford, folks. 10.30 for the Chatham Show. Tom Malone, Johnny Ward, Paddy Power, Gina Bryce and myself looking through the card in depth. And uh, just remember to go easy, folks, today and our coverage in association with Paddy Power. Don't feel like a punter. Feel like a favourite this Cheltenham. Tom Watson, you're welcome to Golf Weekly. Hey, this is going to be fun. Very happy to say you're being captain and, of course, three-time major winner, Padraig Carrington, joins us. Today's special guest on Golf Weekly is Lee Westwood. Thank, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm honoured and delighted. Let's bring in Paul McGinley, who joins us now. Paul, you're very welcome. Shane Lowry, how are you keeping? I'm good, thanks, yeah. Well, I'm as good as I can be. <laughs> the biggest names in golf and Ireland's best golf podcast, Golf Weekly, now exclusively available on Patreon. Go to otbsports.com forward slash golfweekly to sign up now.
Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna automower. Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, 10 past nine. It is OTB AM. And uh, a reminder as well, by the way, that the greatest golf podcast on the planet, yes, it's official, Golf Weekly, is uh, now on Patreon. So if you sign up, you're going to get a guaranteed podcast every Thursday. Uh, you're going to get extra episodes around the biggest tournaments of the year. There'll be interviews with golf's biggest names as well. You'll become an official friend of the pod. What more would you want? And be able to enjoy the uh, chat with the lads, Joe, Nathan, Peter and Fionn. You'll get invites to our golf days and enjoy exclusive watch parties as well around the majors. And you can get involved in the chat. And There's plenty of people that have been involved in it uh, over on Discord as well. So lots to uh, get your hands on there. And by the way, a fresh one out of the oven in the last 24 hours as well. So that is there waiting for you. You just head along to otbsports.com forward slash golf weekly and you can sign up for three ninety nine a month or just search golf weekly on patreon.com and that page is live. And as I said, a fresh pod out of the oven. So head over there and get yourself a whiff of that. So it is uh, 10 past nine and uh, we have a crappy quiz to come. Brian O'Driscoll on route as well in just a couple of moments time. But uh, the... Uh, team obviously been named yesterday for the England game tomorrow and it's a bit of a weird uh, final day on obviously given that we still have another game outstanding when all that's said and done so we don't fully know the uh, final standings um, before we wrap but uh, it's hard to know looking at that team that's been named uh, how we're going to book the trend of recent results and maybe more importantly recent performances um, against England and not be outpowered by them Yeah that's the key question I, I guess I'm looking at it from a more glass half full perspective this morning maybe just because it's a, a Friday and I'm in a good mood but I'm looking at it like imagine if this team actually does beat England and how Irish rugby will seem after this team beats England it will seem that all of a sudden Ireland have a bit of depth and they've got quality and uh, they're back on the right road again I think it is really when you look at it in the cold light of day more likely that England will win this game it's hard to see enough of a trend over the past few weeks to suggest that they've done enough to beat England especially given how England came out on top in such a cracker of a game last Saturday. But you look at, say, the likes of Jack Conan coming into that team, if, if he is taking up that number eight jersey and we start the post-CJ Stander era for Irish rugby with a win against England with Jack Conan in the eight jersey, things will seem extremely sunny. Like if Jacob Stockdale plays well, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if Jacob Stockdale plays yeah. well and uh, get, puts in a good defensive performance and they get the win against England, then everything will seem extremely positive when it I comes think to on, I, I'm like I'm loving the Kool-Aid, right? But I just think there are so many ifs in there. I just, I, I don't know when you look at the team, I'm 100% with you in terms of like, I don't think that James Lowe could have started, but I don't also equally think that everybody should be hurling their return to Jacob Stockdale as the uh, stock stop gap in all of our defensive walls in the back three. I think you look at uh, Robbie Henshaw, even that switch from 12 to 13, he's maybe been our best player in the Six Nations so far. And suddenly you're moving him in further step away from, from that playmaker role. So like, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Connor Murray, like we're talking about not playing Peter Romani because he hasn't played rugby in the last four weeks. Like, and no conversation in relation to Connor Murray about the exact same point. And then you look at the pack and, the, you know, I think we could have... Uh, gone for Ryan Baird in the second row and like throwing him in there. I know there are some powerhouses in his op uh, the opposition second row clearly, and that'd be tough for him. But I think that that would have been the obvious thing to do: leave Ty Byrne where he is, and uh, and it might have brought a bit more stability to it. And the point that we were talking to Quinny about earlier on in relation to Dave Kilcoyne, I think you are for you are giving up something a little bit in the scrum. And like if we talk about that being a crucial area of where the where game is won and lost, I look at I'm clearly I think I'm 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 concerned. I think we're uh, I I hope I'm wrong, but uh, I can yeah. see an England win. Yeah, I was accused of being morbid on Monday morning after the Scotland defeat. So uh, I, if I was consistent, I'd be with you. But I think maybe just looking at the team, I'm looking at the possible positives. I think I think if they win, it's just going to be this this massive. Uh, it'll be a huge bubble that that uh, positivity that Irish hope will find itself in.
Yeah, it'll be it'll be uh, what went wrong and where do we go from here on? I can I can foresee that being the line of question. Well, because well, Wales are going to win the Grand Slam by the way tomorrow night, so it is where do we go to hide from here? Basically, oh, for geez. certain cohorts of, of our team, this, I I think they should blow up the Six Nations if Wales win the Grand Slam. Like uh, it's going to happen. It is one hundred percent going to happen tomorrow. You do know that. It's outrageous. I saw Wim P- Wayne Pivak suggesting something along the lines of that it would be a deserved Six Nations. I mean, it just like it wouldn't. Like, let's just call this bed as bed here. They've been jammy. But I know you don't want to go down a, a Welsh rabbit hole again when you've been, you've spent too much of the last couple of months down that hole. <laughs> yeah, no, th- thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation, but I shan't be, uh, <laughs> shan't be following you, uh, okay, uh, you. Mr. No, Rabbit. That's fair enough. On that brilliant note, OTBAM live with association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Brian O'Driscoll is going to talk much more sense than the pair of us uh, from half past nine, looking ahead to the weekend's uh, rugby. And uh, right now, it is time for the crappy quiz. Chris Martin. Oh, you're kidding me. September. Kyle Lafferty. Are you joking me? Is that right? I know. Is that right? Ah. Else. Like that is one of the most stupid questions. Darius <laughs> Vassell? Seriously, you all need to just stay quiet. This is getting really annoying doing this quiz. What is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome along to the shoutiest segment on Irish radio. It's the scintillating, it's the stupefying, it's the splendido crappy quiz. Every Friday, we pit three of team off the ball up against each other in a no-holds-barred quiz of sporting factoids at the end of the week. Allow me to welcome today's contestants. Our first contestant today sits in silence this week because he knows that if you chase the dragon for long enough, the dragon will eventually chase you. This weekend, Wales will win the Grand Slam and this man will go into hiding and become the first human in history who will have to get rid of a moustache to create a disguise. Give it up for the mustachioed menace, Ger Gilroy. Oh, yeah, that's uh, it's coming off this weekend. <laughs> yeah, uh, Guy Incognito takes off his moustache after Wales do the Grand Slam, I think is the headline. Our next contestant has this week abandoned his wife and kids. Albatross Addict 1234 and Birdie Hunter 78 are his children now. The Golf Weekly Discord, his new family WhatsApp. His previous family will need to fend for themselves now as he's too busy trying to get himself a European tour junket to Dubai. Give it up for the beast of Ballyhonis, Nathan Nate Dog Murphy. All true, all true, on. It seems like you've moved out of home as well. It's a different background. <laughs> I have. I've been uh, banished, banished to the spare room. Well, it's uh, it's a nice looking spare room. You're very welcome. Our last contestant today has been called out time and time again by the beast of Ballyhonis to show his face and fight like a man. Will the Southside dub be able to handle the roughness and general disgracefulness of a battle with a Mayo opponent? Time will tell. Give it up for Phil the Power Egan. I think the dubs have done all right with Mayo down the years. They certainly have. Mm. It's very much Avengers Assemble this morning on the crappy quiz. People have been screaming and crying for a Jer versus Nathan versus Phil Battle Royale. Well, you're welcome, everybody at home. You are getting it this week. As ever, the format is a classic crappy quiz with a series of questions on different themes. Then it's onto the slip and slide of trivia, which is the rapid fire round. You can podcast a crappy quiz on otbsports.com or on the OTB Sports app. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to click the thumbs up, even if we contribute nothing but misery to your morning. Round one is the boring questions round. Never multiple choice. Sure. Who was the last person not called Elliot or Mullins to be crowned top trainer at the Cheltenham Festival? Paul Nichols. Too quickly. Too quickly in there. It's Nicky Henderson. Oh. Cheltenham show host. Wow. He's been doing it all week and uh, hasn't even come across Nicky Henderson. 2012 uh, champion trainer. Nathan, question one for you. Johnny Sexton passed Stephen Jones out at the weekend to go into fourth place in the all-time top point scorers list in Six Nations history. Can you name the three players still ahead of him? So Sexton is fourth, is what you're telling me? Yes. Johnny Wilkinson. Thank you. Uh, you've got to get all <laughs> three. got to get all three. <laughs> Owen Farrell? Is that an answer? It is, it is, it is. No, yes, come that's on. that's an answer. Uh, oh, and the really? third one. Gavin Hastings. No! Oh, Ron O'Gara. Ron O'Gara. Oh, damn it. 
<laughs> uh, Raj, Wilkinson and Farrell are the three. Oh, I wouldn't have said Farrell. Oh, sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, nice. Very good. What do you mean, whoa, sorry. whoa, I didn't even think about the last one because you said the second one was wrong. No, I said the second one was no, wrong. No, 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 we didn't say you it was wrong. You said Gavin Hastings. Oh, piss off. No. <laughs> Sorry. Don't start! <laughs> you said Gavin Hastings, the whole world Gavin heard Hastings. it! Because I wasn't even thinking about well, it! Well, look, you, you gave the me answer! Wrong. <laughs> wait, wait, what did you think? You said we the second one was about. wrong! No, I didn't. You literally went, eh, eh. I went I went back. Back. Sure. I, went so I don't know who it is, I can't see anyone. <laughs> well, tough luck! I mean, come uh, on! Yeah, that is a joke. That is an absolute joke. So I, see, on, I see, Sorry. I see you've brought no. Adrian Barry with you. So, somehow he is inside your skin. Sorry. <laughs> Expl sorry, why would you give a correct answer ring for the first one, nothing for the second one when it was right? Well, I mean, I mean, now you're just being uh, an asshole. Here, that is a load of, that, like, that undermines the entire quiz. It doesn't undermine <laughs> the entire quiz. <laughs> <laughs> you guessed why didn't even think about, about, didn't even think about the last oh, answer. I didn't even think about the last answer. You said it. You said an answer. You said an answer. If you didn't give yeah, an answer... Because I, just, I was out and I didn't care. Well, that, that's unfortunate, uh, isn't it? Phil. <laughs> Phil, question one for you. Uh, name the teams in Ireland's group for their last World Cup qualifying campaign. Of course, we start next week. Um, right. World Cup. Okay, so I'm trying to think back because it all meshes into one, right? So we got to the playoff. Let's work our way back. Got to the playoff against Denmark. So who was in that group? Okay, we came back off the Euros. Then we played. So I remember we played Austria. Georgia were in that group. Um, who else was in it? Georgia, Serbia. Austria, Georgia, Serbia, Moldova. Am I missing one? You're missing one. One more name to give us. Austria, Serbia, Georgia, Moldova. There's a... Oh, who? Uh, Wales. Oh, Correct. That was pretty good. Yeah. That is off the mark. <laughs> Wales. Nathan is fuming. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. fuming after round one. Uh, we can see you. Fun. You know we can see you? We can see you there shaking your head. I can't see any of you. I okay. can't see any of you, so I don't really care. <laughs> Go on. I'll win it anyways. <laughs> round two. Round two is the Ivan et Niage round. In this round, I'm going to play you the voice of a sports person, and all you got to do is tell me who's speaking. However, the clip will be played backwards to you. Jer, who is this? What are you thinking, Jer? Can I hear it again? Yeah, play it one more time. There's no clues here, like what language these people are speaking. No. Ah, come on, there's no clues, it's easy. Come on. Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> no. What? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> What? Uh, it's it does sound like Jurgen Klopp because it sounds like he's not speaking English, but he is speaking English. Let's hear the answer. Yeah, Teddy Sheringham, Robbie Keane, all, all them uh, Klinsmann, all them top strikers that play for Spurs, watching them, and yeah, obviously they played in all the big games and, and scored all the big goals. So I was hoping one day I'd be able to do that, and yeah, it's been going well so far this season. Harry Kane uh, is the correct answer. Tough one. Nathan, who is this? Jürgen Klopp? <laughs> no, it's not Jürgen Klopp. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear the answer. Well, you see, I mean, look, uh, I speak for three hours, or roughly three hours a week on the Sunday game every year. And, and people decide I'm this fella or I'm that. 
because of those three hours, which is fair enough. Uh, I, it's a subjective opinion. It's based on years of experience. Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. That's the land. This is impossible. I, I actually thought that was Thomas too. <laughs> That's what I was thinking as well. They all sound German, I think, is the point you're making. Phil, have a listen to this. That sounds like Joe Schmidt. Let's have a listen. Um, yeah, they probably would have said the same thing. They ah, just uh, would, would have tried to go out and put out their, their best performance possible. I, I think there were some really special moments for us in that test match. I think it was a, 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 a heck of a battle. Joe Schmidt. Phil Egan is off the mark in that round as well. He is 2-0 up against both Jared and Nathan here as we move on to round three. How's that hubris is... working out for you now, Nathan? Well, we all know the whole thing is a sham now. Big time, Charlie. Round An three. Absolute sham. Is the swing low round ahead of Ireland against England this weekend in the Six Nations. This round will test your knowledge on some of the great English sports people of all time. Sure. Name the last English rugby player to be crowned World Player of the Year. Johnny Wilkinson? Correct. 2003. Nathan. Great Britain and England's most successful Olympians are all cyclists. But who is England's most successful Olympian who is not a cyclist? Most successful here being the most gold medals. That's pretty easy. Need an answer. Sorry, who's the quiz master here? That was Owen said that. You, <laughs> Bit of authority, maybe. You can't see. <laughs> Waste of time, come on. Chris with the most gold medals. <laughs> oh, he's rattled. Come on. Um, not a cyclist is what you're saying. Come yeah. on, it's an hour long. Um, Mo Farah. No. Rebecca Jerry, Adlington? Jerry, you knew it. Steve Redgrave or Matthew Pinsent? Oh, it is Steve Redgrave with boom. five gold medals. <laughs> Phil, name the last English manager of a European Cup or Champions League winning team. European Cup or Champions League. I'm not sure. It's Nathan's facial expression saying that this is a very easy question or that he doesn't know the answer. He doesn't know either. Is it Joe Fagan? Three from three, Phil Egan. Like Is this the crappy quiz or the football questions for Phil quiz? Pitta, <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> It is uh, Phil 3, Chair 1, Nathan nil after three rounds. Uh, we move on to round four. I've never actually seen you like this. I guess it probably comes from a point. It of me over. It's pressure. It's pressure. <laughs> Just the things. I guess it comes from Come a point on. of always winning. Uh, this is this is what the dubs would be like if they ended up not going seven in a row. They just become really bad losers immediately. No, th this is exactly what happens for the dubs. Everything is put in their favor. Bit of cheating along the way. Bit of straightforwardness in the football question for Phil. Come on, just get on with this, please. Round four is the fun-free magic number round. Contestants get three points here, they're getting the number exactly right, and if no one manages that, the nearest contestant who doesn't go bust gets two points. So if you don't mind, give us the following number. The number of points Ireland notched against Serbia in the 2018 World Cup qualification campaign, plus the number of teams with a positive goal difference in this year's Premier League season so far, plus the number of Premier League titles Ole Gunnar Solskjaer won as a player, plus the number of times Leinster have won the Pro 12 or Pro 14 since Munster last won it. Your 30 seconds expire when Sinatra sings Bright Shiny Beads. What's the third question again? The third question is the number of Premier League titles Solskjaer won as a football player. What's the question about Serbia? How many points did Ireland get against Serbia in their World Cup qualification campaign for 2018? So they played them twice, how many points did they get? 
the number of teams with a positive goal difference in the Premier League this season, the Soul Shark question, and how many times Leinster have won the Pro 12 or 14 since Munster last won it. Jer Gilroy, what have you got? He's still writing up there. Nathan's still writing. What have you got, Jer? 18. 18. Nathan? 17. Phil? 20. It's 22. Phil gets two points. Jer gets one point. Nathan gets nothing. Uh, well, this is <laughs> not your not your day. Oh, oh, what? What they, chair went for what? They just didn't suit Jer you. Gets, they just Jer gets one for being the second closest. They just didn't suit you, Nathan. Did he not go for 16? Oh, you're deaf as well. No, Jer went for one. You went for 17. Jer went for 18. And mm. Phil went for 20. So the number of points Ireland got against Serbia was one. The number of teams with a positive goal difference is 10. Oh. Solskjaer Sol won six Premier League titles as a player, and Leinster have won five Pro 12 slash 14 titles since Munster last won it. Down, set up. Brings the total to 22. And as I say, it is Phil 5, Jer 2, Nathan nil. Our winner tonight will be decided in the round that separates the men from the boys, the Eric Cantonis from the Eric Lamellas. It's a no theme, a particular ridiculously easy rapid fire round. The score you get in this round will be added to your score in the previous round, and there are 40 seconds for everyone to answer from the same set of questions. You know the drill at this point. Phil Egan, are you ready? I am, yeah. Phil, your 40 seconds starts now. Who was Germany manager before Joachim Lowe? Jurgen Klinsmann. What age is Stephen Cluxon? 38. 39. Jur, who was top scorer this season in the Scottish Premiership? Edward. Correct. Troy Parrott scored his first goal against which team last week? Huddersfield. No, Plymouth Argyle. Marvin Hagler's last fight was against who, Nathan? Oh, no. Sugar Ray Leonard. Bohemian's new away jersey features the name of which band, Phil? Fontaine's DC. Correct. In what year did Tyrone last win the All-Ireland? 2008. Correct. How many NFL teams are there? 18. 32. Time is up. Phil Egan walks away with it. Nathan Murphy has walked away from the quiz. Take it away, Phil. What do you have to say in your victory uh, speech? Like, I remember a few weeks ago, Nathan was ridiculing us as the Europa League format. And here he is, the, the big Champions League stage. And basically is Sevilla. Just couldn't do it on the Champions League. Back to the Europa League with him. He was, are... he was braying like a donkey for you to come on, Phil. Braying like a donkey. And all we can hear are the donkey sounds, sounds in the background <laughs> because he has proven himself to be third, third best. I'm, I'm happy with my silver medal this week. You know, I'll, I'll humbly go away and do some work. I'll work on my trivia. I'll try not to be first up with the questions. But Nathan has just absolutely... He has embarrassed himself, his family, his parish and his county. That's what happened today. Yeah, he certainly has. All we're seeing is darkness now coming from Nathan Murphy's spare room. Um, it is a grim, grim sight. But next week, hopefully, we'll have him back in his living room and uh, he'll be back to being the champion again. Who knows? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can send in your questions. As we mentioned, you can DM us that off the ball. And we'll chat to you next week here on The Crappy Quiz. Congratulations, Phil. Thank you. Spot. Oh, you're kidding me. September. Kyle Lafferty. Are you no! joking me? Is that right? I know. Is that right? Uh, anybody else? Leash, was it? Like, that is one of the most stupid questions. <laughs> Darius Vassell? Seriously, you all need to just stay quiet. This is getting really annoying doing this quiz. What is going on here? <laughs> 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 You were mentioning how Jack Conan at number eight seems a bit of a surprise. I know the you know absence of Will Connors um, is something of a surprise to everybody, given that he picked up a late injury and this was a late call uh, to bring in Josh van der Flyer. But this jigging around and bringing in Jack Conan, this seems like the most striking surprise of all in that starting fifteen. Yeah, I think it does. I think you know what it um, what it provides is is that extra ball carrying ability in the back row, and um, you know the, the the reality is against England over the last number of years we've been beaten up by them and lost the physical encounter and the more ball carriers the more physical specimens that you can get in your team that can get you an advantage line or can be collision winners the more chance you have of laying a platform for um your halfbacks to dictate play and for them to be able to get you into your shape so as much as i was surprised to see conan uh, in the eight jersey, I, I think it's probably a clever selection with the knowledge as well cj sanders news this week 
um, Caelan Doris on the sidelines. It's, a, it's an opportunity and a development piece as well as something with an eye on this game, but one for the future too, uh, coming down the line with, with the World Cup in a couple of years. I do feel as though he has the capacity. It, sometimes I wish he had, had a bit more anger to him, mm. but he has all the physical attributes to be a great international player. But you kind of feel as though he's just lacking that really nasty edge that you know we've seen in Peter Romani, that we've seen in Sean O'Brien, we see in Billy Vunapola, we see in Curry. It just I don't know if he really wants to hurt people and, and if he hates people when he when he carries into them or he hits them. I think you want to see that in the, the personality of your number eight of really, you know, imposing themselves on the opposition and almost frightening them. And and I and I I suppose he's not quite delivered that. But he's a different sort of player and he definitely gives you go forward, certainly does for Leinster, and now great opportunity for Ireland. Does, does, As you mentioned with Will Connors, yeah, you know, Van der Fleer coming in for him, obvious selection. Yeah, I was just going to ask, in terms of Jack Conan, like you mentioned there, John Giles would often refer to it as, as would he kill his granny. Uh, does what he offer on the ball, um, I guess, counterbalance what he does lack in terms of that, I want to call it something else, but viciousness in the back row? Um. Yeah, I don't. They don't have to. You know, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. You, you can. You know, there are. You look at the at the really great ball carrying number eights around the world, the likes of um, Billy Vanapola, um, who has an edge. Dwayne Vermeulen. You think about mm -hmm. someone like him. Um, but then at, at the same time, you've got a different sort of number eight in Kieran Reid, who doesn't look as though he'd kill his granny, but yet he has all the skill set to be able to. Um, to deliver and, and the finesse to match the power up front, but yet, you know, link play with backs as well. But he, he, it doesn't feel as though he'd stand on you if you got an instant or, or, or got a, um, or an invitation. Um, with Conan, I don't know, it's just there's been something niggling at me for the last four or five years that I thought he was going to be this superb international player that just brought this hardened edge and it just never quite transpired. But his form for Leinster, when he has been playing for them, has been very good, and he and he gives that other aspect. But he, he's he's not someone that's going to do a Sean O'Brien who's going to kind of you know really step up to the opposition and scare them and feel as though you know you've got a fight in your hands. He'll bring the physical aspect. He just won't bring the narkiness. When you've had spells out injured as much as Jack Conan has had, is that the kind of thing that tempers your attitude on the pitch? I don't. I, I think that's part of your makeup, you know. I don't think that that it's something that that kind of comes and goes. Um, I think it's 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 either in you or not, and you're not, uh, or it's not. And I, I think if you look at Peter Omani and the way he spoke during the week, he, he does play on the edge, and he always has, and he wants to be a physical player. And if you take that away from him, he's he's not Peter Omani. He's not that sort of player. Um, so you have to accept what what comes with the individual. But I do feel as though he'd have more international caps if he. If he asked as he was willing to throw around a bit more, and and even sometimes that's a training as well. I remember, you know, early years of, of training with Trevor Brennan when he wasn't in the team. He'd go around firing shots at anyone and everyone. It would be, you know, half contact, but it wasn't half contact to Trev. And I remember him saying one time, "It's all well and good for you. You're in the team. I'm not. So you're gonna you're gonna have to take this if I'm gonna be sitting on the bench or or you know holding shields." Um, and and I guess you know that that to a coach is inspiring to see the appetite and the willingness to to really you know to to reach um you know into the depths of your of your talent and and your ability to play to go this is what it takes to, to get in the team i'm going to throw it about and i'm going to teach these boys i'm not going to make it easy for them yeah in terms of forward play i mean i guess it's not entirely something that has been uh, troublesome from ireland even with the chopping and changing of personnel uh, over the course of the first four games uh, so much so that eddie jones in his pre-match press conference today highlighted uh, ireland's uh, forward play and says it's something we've gotten really really good at and obviously the influence of Paul O'Connell is key and all that but with an Eddie Jones compliment I always kind of worry that there's something else behind it he's you almost sense that he's clearly seen something in there that he thinks they can find their way around and given the recent history and the recent four games between the sides there is enough to suggest that he knows that there is enough in that England pack particularly that can completely negate what Ireland have to offer and I guess it would be hard to argue with with his belief in that regard, if you if you do look at, at you know the way they played and, and watching the game, I thought they played very well. Uh, you know, watching the game live last week, I thought they played even better having watched it again. Um, 
it's it's the way that they can mix their game up. They've got lots of ball carriers in their pack, but they've also got lots of ball players. And if you're looking at their their two props as some of their most effective ball players, you know, you know, the rest of the team can just go about their business. But then they've got uh, Dave Hughes in the in the second row, who also carries the ball brilliantly to the line and is able to play make. You've got Tom Curry, Vonapola in the back row. So, you know, they do have when when they are humming. England are a, a force to be real force to be reckoned with, and it's you know we've we've had difficulty in stopping the juggernaut in the past. And why are they going to break from that type? They know that if they can physically get the better of us, they they have enough firepower in their backs um, to be able to score tries. They they don't have to go through as many phases to create opportunities for themselves. Their X factor seems more impressive than ours currently. You think about what Johnny May is capable of doing, what Watson did last weekend, the explosiveness of them. Even Max Malins got cut, turned over a couple of times, um, but he, he looks as though he poses a real threat. Um, and then you've got others, you know, the the, the experience of their halfbacks and, and Owen Farrell to facilitate that. So I'm not surprised that Eddie Jones will be confident coming over here. They've, they've had our number for the last few years. But, you know, it's there's nothing at stake other than you know, a placing in a higher placing in this year's table, which does mean financial, um, you know, um, financial success. Um, and I'm sure, you know, the union would have reminded both Eddie and and Andy Farrell that the higher placing, particularly, you know, considering the circumstances, will really benefit them. So this is a big, big game for both teams, and I think it'll be a brilliant test match um, because. Ireland having England on the back of the, the last few results at home, they, they're really going to up their game and, and I think they're going to throw down the gauntlet to them. Yeah, one of the changes that Jones has had to make going into this game uh, obviously is the loss of Henry Slade, who I know uh, you in one of your tutorials online pointed out his brilliance in defence. I guess last week you kind of counterbalanced that with what we were looking at and what we were talking about in terms of James Lowe, who drops out of the, the match day 23 entirely. They brought in Elliot Daly in the centre um, at the expense, obviously, of the injured Henry Slade. How does that change things from an England perspective? Um, I think Slade's a really important player for them now. Um, you know, his, his left foot is very important, very educated left foot. He big, big guy. You know, he's probably 6'3", you know, physically um, throws his weight around, um, reads things extremely well, but he also has a real deft touch for a, for a big man. Um, you know, lovely handling, has that, uh, an array of a kicking game besides just the rocket launcher. He has little touches, little grubber kicks, which invite the likes of Johnny May to, to charge onto. So he, he really had a, a big impact against us a couple of years ago when they turned us over um, in the first game of the Six Nations. Uh, he was near man of the match performance, getting a late try. So I think he is a loss, but um, but his his replacement in Daly coming at 13, his favourite position, um, you know, some, someone that always saw himself as an outside centre that became a winger and subsequently a full-back. So I, I, you've got a wealth of experience. You've got 50-plus capper coming in. He's It's a long time. I think it's five years since he's played in the centre for England. But he... Um, he, he's a confident player. He's super quick. Uh, he likes to read through and defend sometimes. He reads it quite well, but yet he's fallen off some tackles in this year's Six Nations. So I'm sure Bundy and, and Robbie will, will test him physically, first of all, but then also the, the responsibility is to make sure that the wingers get active, the blind wingers get active, to stress him. 13 is a difficult position if you haven't played it for a long time to read the short runners, but also have respect for the outside, um, you know, the, the runners out the back, the wingers striking from their blind wing. So Ireland have to take advantage of the, the fact that he's going to be relatively inexperienced and, and won't have had a huge amount of time uh, to train in the 13 jersey even this week. Mm. You mentioned uh, Bundyaki there. He's somebody who's kept really, really sharp in terms of uh, lining out for Connacht during the pretty much the duration of the Six Nations when he hasn't been involved for Ireland. And Jacob Stockdale in a different aspect has worked himself back to full fitness and now back into the starting 15 uh, for Saturday Stockdale looks like he's getting back to the player who you know I guess impressed us a couple of years ago with his debut season in the Six Nations he's even dropped a little bit of weight since he's come back as well he looks to be somebody who will really really relish this test on Saturday yeah you know he he was unfortunate obviously with injury that he wasn't you know included in the squad earlier on in, um, in the campaign 
Jacob Stockdale, you know, he's got his detractors, um, but, you know, particularly from a defensive point of view, but he offers something very unique in, in his go forward, his ability to beat players one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, we talked about the X factor of the English wingers. Well, he's got that in spades. And yes, he has had defensive deficiencies, um, probably even some not as not quite as, as extreme as what we've seen from James Lowe over the last few weeks. So I, I think he's absolutely deserving of another opportunity in there. It's his, it's his best position, uh, playing on the wing and not full back. I think he will get more tries for Ireland playing on the wing. He's an out-and-out -out finisher, not trying to be a creator. Um, you take some of the expectation from you know, his game management at full back, take that away from him and just tell him to go and beat players one-on-one, -on -one, keep it really simple and just follow his centre into the defensive system, whatever he's doing. Um, you know, you know, follow suit. So I think it's a game of basics for Jacob Stockdale, but you know that he has that card in his pocket that he can he can pull it out and and do something amazing, which is often the difference between teams like England. You looked at his try against the All Blacks was the difference in Dublin a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the try he scored against England in Twickenham and that Grand Slam season. Um, all the different tries he scored. You know, the intercepts amongst amongst other things. He's He's a pure out-and-out -out striker in rugby, and you just need to get his confidence levels back up. And I'm not surprised that he leapfrogged over Larmer um, to add a little bit of size to our to our back three as well. If you if you're thinking Larmer, Earls, and Keenan, that's not a huge back three. So to throw a bit of size in there as well, very capable in the air, but also you know confident going forward with with a, an ability to back his own ability. I think. You've got a very exciting player in Jacob Stockdale. We just want to get him back to the form that he showed in his debut season. Mm -hmm. And and if we can get him there, I think he will cause major problems uh, for the English defence this weekend. On the James Lowe front, he obviously isn't in the match day 23 for Saturday. Um, Felipe Contepomi had a really interesting point earlier on in the week. He was talking from a Leinster perspective that, you know, in time, given time, James Lowe will improve on the international stage. And this is a very, and even Keith Wood mentioned it on here, uh, earlier on the week it's a very very tough way to learn your trade is playing international rugby and trying to get up to the speed because it is different to the you know even the latter stages of European rugby with, with Leinster there is a step up here and, and mistakes will be uh, pounced upon more keenly than they would be I guess in the club game but how pronounced is that difference in your experience and, and even watching players since you've retired how pronounced is that step up from provincial I guess, you know, really good displays on the provincial level to making the step up to international rugby. And is the low, I guess, is the low experience so far as, you know, does it diverge as much as we probably anticipated? I, I think it's a really significant step up from even European rugby, even the biggest of European games. Um, even if you look at the likes of the, the quarterfinals, semifinals, finals of Europe, I think they're they're kind of easy test matches, so to speak. Um, I, I do feel as though, you know, he obviously showed really well in his in his debut. Uh, was it against Wales back in in November? Um, I, I was really surprised to read during the week that he has most meters um, in in this year's Six Nations, which is amazing because it doesn't feel as though he's done a huge amount, but he shows just shows how much of a handful he still is to defenses. Um, I think from his own defensive perspective. Whatever about the reads that he struggled with, and there's been a few. Uh, he got cut out a couple of times against Wales. He obviously got cut out, um, in you know maybe got cut out in the Doolan or the Pinot try uh, against France, and then obviously the Hugh Jones one. It's probably just one defensive mishap too many, and it, it as much as the defensive reads have been poor, I I, I don't know if he's a great tackler. And, and I heard Ron O'Gara talking about he doesn't have as much of an appetite for the defensive side of the game as, as the attacking side. My concerns would be, you know, a guy that big and that physical, how is he not ending people? Because I know that he's got an aggressiveness when he carries the ball into contact. It just doesn't seem to reciprocate when it comes to the defensive side of things. He's an, he's an arm grabber. He's not a shoulder hitter. I've never seen him absolutely belt someone and smash them, you know, into next week. Everything seems to be a little bit army, quite high. And when you're reaching with arms, you tend to go high. You, you tend not to reach low and, and get someone around the waist. 
and that's where you get pushed off and that's what happened with Hugh Jones as soon as you start reaching with with your arms you're in a bad body position so any shove off from him he's going to be able to get the impetus from you to um to to catapult yourself forward and yeah, I thought the writing was on the wall, unfortunately, from James O. He'll come back and he'll learn and he'll he'll you know take on board what messages have been handed down to him from Andy Farrell. But it's uh, it's a pretty brutal business at Test Match Rugby. You make a mistake or a couple of mistakes, and someone's waiting in the wings uh, for you know to come in and replace you. Is twenty eight too old to lose those habits, though? No, I think anything can be can be learned. Um, I think you know you look at the way certain players evolved um, under under Joe Schmidt. You know, I, I, when I was playing with Devin Toner, I never saw him as being a ball player. You know, playing off off ten, but then he became a very capable ball player. I think you look at someone like Trevor Brennan, who um, you know you won't mind me saying his his hands were certainly not the strongest part of his game when he was at Leinster, but then went over to Toulouse and became a great ball player. It mightn't have looked incredibly natural, but it was just a, a drilled process that you're doing it every day at training, you can get better at it. And he was doing things that I, I never had imagined Trevor doing. Um, so you, you are capable of learning these new skills, but you have to have a willingness to almost put, bring yourself back to zero and learn from scratch. A bit like a scrum half that has a you know, that's three or four seasons under their belt that has a dodgy pass. Sometimes you have to deconstruct to reconstruct and think about the technical side of it and build and then practice on building the correct skills. There's no point in practicing things if it's wrong or if it's incorrect. You've got to practice the right stuff. And James Lowe has a lot to deliver for, for Ireland over the next few years, but he's going to have to go away and work on that part of his game because there's no doubt there's, there's shortcomings in it. Yeah, um, speaking of delivering, somebody who has done over the course of the last five years is, is CJ Stanner. He pretty much shocked everybody earlier on in the week when he announced that not only was he going to be stepping away from international rugby, but he's uh, packing his bags and going back to South Africa and leaving Munster as well. I'd imagine you're as caught off guard by this as, as everybody else. Yeah, it sure was. You know, I don't, I don't know CJ. I've, I've obviously never played. I never played with him. He came after my time. Um, but he's clearly a very popular guy. Um, amazing what he's managed to achieve in, in the short space of time, nearly 150 games for Munster. 50 test matches for Ireland in five or six years is incredible. I know he's 30 or 31 years of age, but imagine what his body must feel like the way he plays the game. He, he does not do injured. He just doesn't. But yet the toll that, that you know, trying to make all the holes he's tried to make over the years, he, he doesn't use footwork. He doesn't sidestep. His hole is making is going through people, and there's some enormous collisions he's been on the receiving end of. And I, I would anticipate that all of those um, add up, add up to feel it, to a body feeling a lot older than 30 or 31 years of age. On top of that, you know, you, you're dealing with a, a wife and, and young child that are, you know, they've been back in South Africa, and um, you know, the, during the pandemic, um, you know, missing home. Um, it, it exacerbates an already difficult situation. So, you know, could he have gone on to bigger money in Montpellier? There was talk of him going there or go back and play in South Africa, where he, he wouldn't make he'd make a fraction of what he's earning here or or in France. But maybe he feels as though he's just achieved enough that he, he's happy to leave on a on a good footing with leaving a little in the tank. And and there's. Um, there's honour in that and you know sometimes there's, there's bigger things than rugby in people's life as much as it's hard to take sometimes he's he's made his decision and he looks as though he's at peace with it yeah he says he's absolutely at peace with it and, and, and even those around him listen to Peter O'Mahony's quotes who are quite touching Peter O'Mahony he's not somebody who you'd expect to be brought to the verge of tears almost seemed like he was a, a pretty emotional figure speaking earlier on in the week when a player is going out like that like like you've been that player essentially where the others are trying to raise their game for your final match how much of an impact is that uh, imminent retirement going to have on Ireland's performance do you reckon on Saturday yeah, of course it'll make a, a you you want to send someone off with a with a victory, but I think it it does become no different than when I was playing. It, we were playing for for a trophy. It wasn't talk about trying to do justice. It was about trying to win a trophy. And 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 this, as much as you can channel your your energy, your 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 physical and mental and emotional energy into um, into trying to do something for CJ, this is about trying to beat one of the best teams in the world. And any time you play against England. I think gone are the days where we we've used the 
um, 600 years of pain of um, of you know the the public's um, delight at beating England. I, I think that ship has sailed. For, for me now, from a player's perspective, it's about beating one of the best teams. There's huge respect for England. There's actually quite a lot of friendship, you know, coming from Lions tours, from previous Lions tours. They got on great with the English players, um, and and there isn't a feeling that there's this huge cockiness and arrogance within that English setup. I think that's a kind of public perception. Whereas from a player's point of view, I think they look forward to delivering a big performance because if you beat England, it means a you've played really well and you've you've delivered um, a, a really impressive game plan because you don't beat England playing sloppily or playing okay. You have to play great, and I think that's the kicker you get from beating England. It's the feel good factor about beating one of the best nations in the world. Yeah. Johnny Murphy um, was on OTB's Six Nations show earlier today with James Downey and our own Neil Tracy. And you can watch the whole thing back now on the OTB Sports app. And Johnny thinks that Ireland aren't far away from hitting their straps in an attacking sense. I also think there's a lot of a lot of flack being thrown at them at the moment uh, in terms of that they're not looking to attack as uh, as much as as we would like. They are. They're just being being inaccurate at times. You look at, you know, and there's been all those memes this week about Tyke Furlong's uh, two steps. If he passes that ball to Johnny Sexton, there's actually a high likelihood that we could score a try from our own 22, where it goes to CJ Stander and then the ball doesn't go to hand off that pass. So, like, they're very, very close in terms of their transition game and their, and their attack to... Uh, you look at Robbie Henshaw, anytime he carries, he's automatically looking to get his hands free post-tackle. They are looking at those things, but it's going to take a while. But I, I certainly do think that um, their willingness and want to, to, to counter and to play off transition is there. And if you just look at that clip in isolation of, of Furlong, you know, two steps, that goes to Johnny, then there's probably a likelihood of a massive line break there, if not a score. Brian, would you agree with Johnny there? Are we that far away or not that far away? Well, I think in that instance, you know, I, I'm doing a, a piece for ITV this weekend on the uh, on our lack in ability to transition from turnover um, from defence to attack. And I think there's a bit of mindset, but I think there's a big, ba a big piece about just inaccuracy and almost that we panic, which we shouldn't do because, you know, reading Jerry Thorny during the week, you know, we've, we've 29, no, double, double the amount of turnovers that the other teams have, the next team. Um, but yet we, it feels as though every time we get one, we're not anticipating it. Um, you know, we, I could have picked out a number of different examples um, where, you know, we create a turnover ball. And I'm not just talking about, you know, line out or, you know, sometimes you turn ball over and you get a penalty from it, but genuine turnovers where you could play with it. And and it feels as though you could just ad ad adopt the simple policies, the unwritten rules of what you do on turnover ball. Two passes where possible. It's not always uh, applicable to, to every situation because sometimes you get it in close quarters and you have to create a quick rook ball, but then get two passes. You can always kick it another phase or two phases later, or you can kick it out at the extremities and stress the defense that way. But our willingness to kick the ball so quickly after turnover doesn't make any sense. You give that to any other team, you know, on a knock-on advantage, play a phase, play a couple of phases. If nothing comes of it, the ref will bring you back. It's unlikely they're going to blow it up too quickly. But I know Johnny Sexton in the post-match um, conf press conference was frustrated. I I'm frustrated watching at that because it's a part of our game that we've never been very good at, but it's something that you could absolutely practice and get considerably better. And if we could get one or two scores or one or two line breaks from that turnover possession, I think it would put a different complexion on our attacking game because it would you know, take the pressure off from the public perception that we're just chasing kicks all day. It would, it would allow us to feel as though we have an attacking mindset Whereas a lot of the time it feels like we're playing quite a defensive, quite a safe game. Let's play with a bit of freedom, particularly on turnover ball, where it's penalty advantage, it's free, off you go. If it works for you brilliantly, if it doesn't, you'll come back and, and you'll get the scrum or, or you'll get a second crack at it. And he's right, Johnny was right about that, that instance with um, CJ just needed to pass the ball to Johnny because... Um, Maitland's in big trouble. If he just passes, Johnny straightens and then he's a couple of guys outside him and worst case scenario, you're dealing with a 50, 60 metre 
uh, line break, whereas James Lowe has to regather and, and boot the ball down the pitch and concede possession. Has improved the prospect of Scotland are in creating and engineering those opportunities against Scotland and against England are two very different propositions, though. Um, they are, but you know, not to take credit away from um, from Tyke Furlong. That came from a knock on from Rory Sutherland, a quick recycle. You know, a, a great tip on from Ty Byrne. So he's playing heads up and then great footwork. That, that, that's very easy, could happen against England. And you mightn't get the same level of success at the Rook because England will be very um, knowledgeable in the fact that Ireland have significantly the most turnovers in the game. And so their Rook focus will be huge this week. But there's no doubt we'll still get three or four turnovers. It's what you do with that turnover possession. And I'm not saying you don't kick it because we did get some success from kicking it with good chase and good accuracy. But we want to try as well. We want to play. And I, I think you might beat teams in, you know, some teams in the Six Nations. You might be, beat three out of five teams playing the way we're playing. But I think you've got to have an ability to show a little bit more if we're ultimately trying to build ourselves towards getting into a World Cup semi-final. At the moment, the way we're playing, I don't feel as though we're playing a style that's going to get us into a World Cup semi-final. We need another phase of evolution. And that comes with our turnover play and our willingness also to play off scrum a little bit more. I think we're trying to set things up way too much. Let's have a go. You know, we can always kick from the extremities. Our fullbacks and our wingers can kick. Draw the fullback up, kick over, put pressure. That's how you squeeze pressure in territory as well. But let's have a go as well. What, 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 whatever happens having an attack off first phase or scrum play deep in your own territory, the best ball to work off. So I think we can show a little bit more ambition. I said it a few weeks ago, and I don't think that's changed any. Ambition from turnover, ambition from scrum. And I think that'll go a long way towards people you know, getting off the Irish team's back of playing a little bit negatively. Mm. Our rugby on off the ball is with thanks to Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team, team of us, everyone in. Brian, what's a realistic realistic expectation for Ireland this Saturday? I just want them to play well. I, I, I genuinely don't care about the result. I just want them to play well. And um, and you're playing, if, if England come and play their best game, are they favourites? I think they are because I do think they've got more firepower than us at the moment. The way they played last week, and even in parts against Wales, I do think that they will create lots of opportunities for themselves, and we really have to work for our opportunities. So what, what do Ireland need? A huge defensive display, brilliant discipline, and then take the one or two opportunities that they manage to create for themselves. And even then, it's going to be a close game. I think it'll be a great test match, and I do think it'll be close. But I do think that England are just marginal favourites because of what they showed in, in the last eight days. OK, Brian O'Driscoll, thanks so much for taking time out this evening to speak to us. Enjoy the match, enjoy the weekend. Cheers, Richie. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best